that you are here. Thank you so much for being in our house tonight, the house of the Lord here at Global Vision. We honor you for your presence. You can be seated all over the house. I want to give you just a couple of uh, kind of some schematics and schedule and ground rules a little bit, if you will, uh, for tonight's uh, discussion and lively debate. It's going to be super exciting. Uh, I know, obviously, that uh, not just some of our church folk are here, but a lot of other churches and other church folk are here. And then some non-church folk are here as well, and that's okay. I'm just glad that everybody is in the house tonight. Amen. I I'm honored that you're here. Uh, we even have people outside that aren't happy to be here. I'm not sure why they showed up, but they're here nonetheless. And uh, I promise everyone will be uh, well protected and respected tonight in this uh, discussion and in this debate. So uh, I want to say uh, just a word before I bring up my friend, and I do mean my friend. Uh, many of you don't know uh, anything about the context of our church. I know you're, you're finding bathrooms, and we're pretty high-tech redneck around here. We've been in, in tent church for four years, and uh, so a lot of people aren't used to that. As it gets a little cooler, we'll crank on the heaters, and we'll get things uh, to a comfortable level for you in the house. But and let me just say this. Uh, not everybody's here for a, a flat, spherical earth debate, right? Some people are here maybe, uh, maybe you're searching, you know, maybe your mind's already made up, or for some of you, maybe you're here for the wrong reason. Let me just say this. If you're here for the wrong reason, would you please let everyone else enjoy what's going to happen tonight in the house? We would appreciate that very, very much. As Christians, and, and I have to talk from a Christian perspective because I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, and, and I know not everybody in the room is a Christian, nor am I forcing that upon you. We'll both preach the gospel tonight. We're gospel preachers. We're not heretics. We believe that Jesus is not a way, but the one and only way to the kingdom of God. We, all, we believe that in this room, okay? Now, there are some things that we are worlds apart on. <laughs> worlds apart. There are things that we're worlds apart on, there is no doubt. And, uh, and we'll discuss those things. But listen to me very close. We have a lot of live stream cameras going, including all of our platforms, many other platforms, Pastor Dean's platform. And so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of working parts tonight, right? We got security. We got all of that. We don't want to have to quiet anybody down, okay? We don't want to have to, you know, drag anybody out. And so let's just all be uh, friends and family. Listen, the worst thing about this culture, one of really the top three worst things, things about this culture is we think that disagreement is automatic discrimination. We can disagree and be okay about some things, right? At the end of the day, God's right, right? God, God's right. I'm not right. He's not right. You're not right. They're not right. It's not us and them. And so listen very, very closely. Uh, I, I'm going to talk and, and our people know I cry as much as I preach sometimes. So it's a weird context to cry in, but, but let, me, let, let me just share something with you from my heart that I think is important, and we're going to get started, and we're really going to have a good time tonight. Might get lively, might get a little dicey, but it's going to be fun, right? It's going to be fun. We're going to let the Word of God do its work, and, uh, and we're coming tonight from a strictly Christian perspective. But listen to me. As much as in this room there are great levels and varying degrees of disagreement, Understand that at the end of the day, we want to leave being friends, being Christians, being somewhat unified as we can. We will, as believers, attack, perhaps, ideas and ideologies. But we're not going to tolerate attacking people and attacking individuals, okay? He's not here to attack me, and I'm not here to attack him. Now, both of us have very demonstrative personalities, and so both of us will have to harness ourselves a little bit, and, and that's okay. And that's just part of who we are. That's why God made us, and perhaps that's the reason that God of the universe put us up here on this platform and maybe not some others, because we, we know when we can really mash the gas, and as the young people say, go ham, and we know maybe when we need to dial things back a little bit. So the context for why we're here tonight is... It's not that I didn't know what he believed about the earth and he didn't know what I believed about the earth. We've been friends for a while and I preached for him at the Skyfall Conference and had a wonderful time. I was there to, to preach on deliverance. I wasn't there to preach on cosmology, nor did he ask me to, right? And so we knew where each other was. But however long ago it's been now, it seems like months, but I guess really only a little more than a month, I had my now famous rant. Uh, in a Sunday morning message for about 12 to 15 minutes uh, because you have to understand as a local church pastor there was just a lot of division that began to creep in uh, in various ways and various people and I thought you know what I'm just going to kind of nip this now I'm a guy that just kind of gets up and says what I feel pastorally needs to be said but here's 
what I under anticipated, right? I, I under anticipated on both sides just how passionate people are in many ways about this issue. And so I really picked a scab inadvertently and found out very quickly that there are people on both sides that don't just have a little bit of belief, but a lot of belief, right? And a lot of pa passion behind those beliefs. And so all of that being said, all things being equal tonight, we are not going to, as the old timers say, fix Rome overnight, okay? I I'm not going to spend the entirety of my time trying to convince you of my position, nor he is. What we're trying to do tonight is draw some simple conclusions from the Word of God and say, what is the Lord really saying? And for those of you who aren't Christians, I want you to understand that tonight you're going to find out both from this man of God and from myself and from the Bible, regardless of where we are cosmologically, you're going to find out that there is a God in heaven that loves you deeply and Jesus Christ died for you. He wants you to be saved. There is only one gospel and it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because we don't serve some dead Jew in a Palestinian tomb, we serve a risen Savior. You can have freedom and liberty and victory tonight. We can at least agree on that would you shout amen in the house so as our folks are getting everything prepared make sure we have pastor Dean's mic and everything he's going to need here here's how things are gonna flow tonight I told him uh, listen we, we had a uh, a gifts debate uh, a year or two ago, a couple years ago, a, a kind of a deliverance debate. And we had a guy, and he was super stiff, you know, and he just managed the time. And I said, you know what? I, I don't want us to have that divisiveness and be like, oh my goodness, we've only got one minute left. I said, I really want to make this a debate, but also a discussion. And so here's what we're going to do. In a moment, when I bring Pastor Dean to the platform, we're going to sit down in these comfy chairs, and we're really just going to have a bit of a discussion, right? We're going to open ended, just, just bare bones, hillbilly honest, ask a few questions to each other. I want you to get to know his mindset and the inner workings of how he was led uh, into this uh, theological position as well as myself. And then after just a little bit, kind of get to know you time, uh, then we are going to allow him to go into his time and uh, he will take the time that he needs. I know he'll have some things hooked up through the, you know, the screens and the HDMI cables and all of that. And so he'll have full control over all of that. Once he does that, then I will get up and it won't be rebuttal time. I'll then get up and give my, my biblical arguments from my vantage point. And then while each of us are speaking, we'll be jotting some things down. You know, perhaps maybe here's a question or maybe here's a, a contradiction or something that didn't quite sound right. And we can write that down. So then after I get through with my discussion, he can then get up and give a rebuttal to what I said, and then I'll get up after that and give a rebuttal to some of the things that I wrote down what he said. And the only way to, to keep us from going back to back over and over again and, and making things boring and mundane is to split it up that way, all right? So again, we're not going to answer everybody's questions. What I found in this debate is that, holy smokes, this debate could go for a week. There's a lot of YouTube videos. There's a lot of Twitter, right? There's a lot of Facebook. There's a lot of stuff on both sides of the... We're not going to be able to deal with all of it tonight, but we're going to do the best that we possibly can. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to respectfully get on your feet and give a good applause for the man of God, Pastor Dean Olu. Come on up here, Pastor. Thank you for being at our house tonight. We honor you. We welcome you. Hallelujah. All righty. Wonderful. Well, amen. Thank you, brother. Whew. Well, we're going to have a lively time tonight. It's going to be exciting. I want you to just, you know, kind of welcome the people and just kind of give us, and again, we won't take a, a long, long time with this, but, you know, hey, church it until tomorrow, and you drove a long ways to get here, many of you, and uh, so it's going to be a good time. Kind of give us a, just a, a working idea in the ministry of how you were led into this. The glory of God was around me as I walked down the aisle. I don't even remember. I don't even remember. I remember stepping out of the aisle. I don't remember walking down it. 
And I got up there with the, the pastor and prayed and accepted Jesus. And I was powerfully born again and baptized not long after that. But then, of course, that, I got into my teenage years. And my parents divorced. And so we quit going to church. And, um, of course, like most teenagers, I got into my friends kind of drew me into alcohol and drugs and sexual immorality. And I got into all that real heavy during my high school years and my first year in college and uh, so when I got, I was 19 years old, I decided, well, I'm going to go out and work. You know, in fact, I was in uh, Alabama. I was at Troy State University. It's now Troy. And uh, I was really feeling depressed. And I was partying. You know, I was in Sigma Chi fraternity. I was getting drunk every night and partying every night. And I was getting burnt out. And I had a modeling contract. I was supposed to be in the first Die Hard movie and all that stuff. And so we're, we're, we're getting ready to do that. That's a Christmas movie, by the way. <laughs> I just is. want you to know that. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, my favorite ornament's the one where he's in the air duct, and yeah. Um, but uh, I was going to just go work for the summer, and um, I was going to work for the summer and then go to Hollywood. Actually, that's where I was headed, and uh, God had other plans. The guy I started working for started talking to me about Jesus, and I knew everything he was saying was true. And then when he finally said, used the scripture from Galatians, he said, no drunkard's going to inherit the kingdom of God, and I was a drunkard, man. Yeah. And... Uh, I was convicted for three weeks, and then somewhere on my day off, about three, about a month into this, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The first time I really know that God spoke to me, and he said, Son, you can have everything the world has to offer and go to hell, or you can surrender your life to me and live forever. And I, he was making me choose. And I could see if I went to Hollywood what was going to happen. The Lord just gave me a vision. I saw it. And, uh, and I said, Well, Lord, I'm going to go with you. And I told him, I said, Lord, I'm going with you or I'm not going at all. I will not be a hypocrite. And so I went and prayed with my boss that day and repented of my sins and really quit the drinking and the drugs and the alcohol and the sexual immorality and turned my life over to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've had some powerful experiences with him. Uh, uh, just shortly after that, I had an open vision of, of heaven, saw him. He called me to the ministry. That's a whole other story. But so I started preaching. Uh, when I was 19, preaching on the street and witnessing to people, uh, my first convert was a high-level Satanist witch, and that was, uh, uh, that was an experience. Uh, I learned a lot there. And in fact, I've been doing deliverance since 1987. Amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, then God began to progress me on and have me start planting churches, and I did that. And I've done a little bit of everything, preaching prisons and did evangelism and did college campus ministry all over the country and stuff like that and been to uh, preach in the Middle East, spent time in Middle East, Africa, the island of Mauritius out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So I've led a lot of people to Jesus over the years. A lot of them are pastors now, ministers now. So um, I've been in the ministry a long time. And so in 20, um, 2008, I was in a church in Washington, D.C. It was, it was kind of under working on staff. I wasn't the head guy. And I found out that they were compromised in a lot of areas. They were actually semi-pro-abortion. It was, it was horrible. And uh, I knew the Lord wanted me to speak up and deal with it and confront it. So I did. And uh, the Lord told me, he said, they're going to fire you on November 30th. It's 2008. They're going to fire you. And I said, yeah, okay. They're going to fire you. And then when you do, I want you to go back to your hometown and start a church. So uh, they fired me on November 30th. And uh, <laughs> I went back home, and we started Fire and Grace Church in Opelika, Alabama. We're right next door to Auburn University, so I'm a big Auburn fan. And, uh, and that's where we started 2009. So fast forward, you know, I preach on just about everything. I talk about the Nephilim, the giants, the alien stuff. The, you know, I talk about everything. And that's why I'm going to this place, because in 2015, the Lord spoke to me about two months before God really opened my eyes to this. And he said, uh, he said I got something else to show you. And it's big. And I thought, what in the world could it be? I mean, I'm already casting demons out of Christians. I'm already, you know, ostracized. With that. I had to walk away from the assemblies of God, just become independent, you know. And uh, I said, what could it be? And so a friend of mine that, I, that had gotten saved out in Hollywood, I mean, this guy worked with all the big folks in Hollywood. He'd gotten saved, and I was kind of mentoring and discipling him from a distance. And one day he just sent me this question. He said, does firmament earth ring a bell? Now, he's already a little strange being in Hollywood, but I was like, I was like, what is he talking about? I don't even know. So he sent me this video. And it said nothing about flat earth or biblical cosmology. It said nothing about it in the beginning, but I just started watching it. And the first part of it was a lot about NASA's fakery, where they've been caught faking stuff with the ISS and 
all kind of stuff and the, the moon landings and all that. And I already didn't believe in the moon landing. So he sent me this, and I'm like, what is he talking about? But as he got about halfway through it, the Holy Spirit just came all over me. I knew. I said, you know what? They've lied about everything. Not just some things, but everything. And I was, began to see, you know, the high-altitude balloon footage, and there, there is no curve, and the long-distance photography, and there is no curve. And we've done the experiments ourselves. With, and so I began to see these things, and I was like, wow. And then I pulled the Bible out again and went back and go, you know, I, I began to realize I have believed men, what men had to say about God's creation instead of what the Bible just plainly said. And and I realized, you know, even in my younger days, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I would read Joshua 10 where Joshua told the, the earth, he told, you know, he's standing on the earth and he tells the sun and the moon to stop moving. And I would always say, wait a minute, Lord, how does this happen? Because he didn't say, tell the earth to stop spinning. So I, that always troubled me. I could never reconcile that in my mind with what I had been taught from a child. And once God opened my eyes to this, and then I began to see the evidence, and, uh, and which I'm going to share a lot of that, I began to see the evidence. Uh, I pulled my Bible out, and I pulled out my Strong's and my Greek and Hebrew dictionaries and lexicons and started going back to it all. And, you know, and I had to admit that I hadn't just taken God's word literally in those areas of how he described he, he created the earth and that it was still in at rest, that it was motionless, that it was stable, that it was not flying through this vast universe. That, that, that he, didn't, he didn't teach any of that. And so it took me about a month. I, I couldn't sleep much <laughs> because I just kept studying and studying and studying. And then finally the Lord had me share it to our church and I turned off everything I turned off our public broadcast and said I'm just going to share it to our church and see how how they respond and it it's been amazing and then that was eight years ago mm -hmm. and man it's been quite the ride since then I mean it's it's exploded and um and here we are yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Absolutely. that's my, my side of it yeah a lot of our folks and even a lot of people watching m maybe aren't as into this and understand the reality of it and, and that's one of the reasons i think it's good that two pastors are discussing and debating this from a biblical creationist standpoint but what i find and some of this no doubt is perception because this is so new to me and, and you have to understand i'm going to be a little bit guarded uh, in the way that I discuss things tonight because I can be very bombastic, right? And I, I don't want to seem abrasive. I don't want to come off as a jerk for Jesus. But here, here's one of the things that, that bothers me from the beginning. And, and I just want to ask you a couple of questions because you, you're really the one that we brought here to explain maybe what we don't understand, what we're trying to figure out, right? And so there's no need for me to ask myself these questions. And so the first one is I, I have a hard time with the people that see factual things and I'm not talking about curves and all that I'm, I'm not talking about looking out the window of an airplane and all of that right we could argue that the cows come home but I watched this show uh, this behind the curve right and there were three times in that documentary where the evidence proved rotation and curvature and in each occasion the flat earth individual said Ah, uh, you know, it's it's not going the direction that we want it to go. And then, of course, they ended the whole show with, well, that that that's interesting, right? And so my question is, why is it that when when we do come up with an argument, it seems like it doesn't matter what we say, you're just not going to believe it. Does that make sense? Well, how can you just reject well, that, the that evidence? Well, that works both ways. Yeah. Oh, we, understood. Because yeah. cause we show evidence, and then everybody, you know, people go, "Well, I don't care." Here's the thing about whether it be the gyroscope, that that uh, electronic gyroscope, and I, I remember that. Now you got to remember, you got to look at things like it, just because somebody does an experiment, that experiment has to be repeated again and again mm -hmm. and again and observed again and again before you realize it. But see, Michelson Morley, the two scientists in the days of Einstein, did an experiment, the famous one, where they proved. Uh, that the earth was not moving through the ether. And the ether was uh, uh, an accepted concept back then. And really, more and more physicists are coming to accept the ether. Now, what the ether is, is it's an unseen, you can see it sometimes if you zoom in on the moon, but it's actually a, a, a dense type, superfluid type gas. It gets more dense as you go up. And I've, I've talked about it a lot, but here's what they, they discovered. When Michaels and Morley did their experiment, they did find one sixth movement 
okay? Because the ether is moving. The ether is what we believe the, the sun and the moon are moving in a circuit, as the Bible says in Psalm 19, that the sun and the moon's moving in a circuit over us and that they're at a certain altitude and that literally that ether current is what's pushing it around. Now, I found government documents that actually admit this, that they believe in the ether current and they believe in the ether. So the ether is moving. So certain instruments, like when Michelson and Morley did their test to see if the earth was moving and the gyroscope, sometimes they're going to pick up the movement of the ether and not necessarily is, does it mean that the earth is spinning. Now, like one of the big arguments of the global side, the spinning ball side, is the Foucault pendulum. But what we have discovered is that in Smithsonian, I actually have the, the documents, the Smithsonian admits that they use an electromagnet to move it. And my friend Matt Long is here, who used to work, where are you, Matt? This, there he is back there. <laughs> Matt Long used to work for a construction company that actually installed one of those electromagnets on the pendulum. So they say, they try to tell us in the media, through the media and the, and the agenda, is that the earth spinning is what's moving the pendulum. But they, you have tour guides that will admit, when they, the folk out pendulum, they'll admit that they have a, a motor on it, an electromagnet motor, that, it, that if it was left alone, it'd stand still, but they, they keep it moving. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of stuff that they, that's put out for evidence, but once you really look at it, and you could even find them admitting it, that it kind of gets debunked real quick. But there's a movement in the ether for sure. But let me, let me just say this too. I spent, I've spent hours, I was one of the, I am the one that put out the government documents because I, I spent one day, sit, I sat down with a cup of coffee and at like nine o'clock in the morning and I didn't get up until five that, that afternoon digging through the Freedom of Information Act uh, room where there's declassified documents there. I found Russian and United States military, CIA, you name it, documents that admit that we live on a non-rotating flat earth. And I could give you literally dozens and dozens and dozens of those documents that our government admits it, but they kept it secret from us. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of evidence. And the original science, in fact, Einstein created his famous theory of relativity uh, because once they, that, that Michaels and Morley proved by scientific, they admitted that their experiment proved that the earth was not moving, but they could not accept that because they were hardcore Copernicans and they just didn't accept it. And so he came up with the E equals MC squared theory, right? But Tesla, Tesla said his theory was just a bunch of hogwash and he was a fuzzy headed idiot. And Tesla was the one that was the real inventor and true scientist. So, um, so what I'm saying is, is that, that it, it works both ways, you know. But you gotta, I will say this, uh, people that are on our side, my side about this issue, you, you, the other side, you have to remember this about us. We believed everything you believed before. You know, because that's what we were taught. You know, you, we didn't have a choice. I mean, from childhood you, on up, you're, you're, it's ingrained in your head that we're spinning and flying through an, uh, an ever-expanding universe. But here's the reason why you know that's not true. We can observe it. But, but see, remember, brainwashing stops you from being able to think and even accept what you observe. Now, they tell us we're, we're going around the Earth 66,000 miles an hour, 67. I mean, it changes all the time. And they say we're, that, that's we're going around the sun. Then they say that we're moving 500,000 miles an hour through our solar system. And then it says that our solar system is moving through the ever-expanding galaxies at half a million miles an hour. Now, we do that. They say we're doing that, that we've been doing that for thousands of years. And yet... Polaris, the North Star, never moves. When somebody does time lapse, focuses on the North Star, and does time lapse photography, the circles that the star make, the star trails, are perfectly circular. And every night I can walk out of my house and point in a direction, and Orion's belt will come up in the same place every night. Now, if we're flying, spiraling, spinning through this, through an ever expanding universe then the stars we see should have changed. But we can look back at the ancient Egyptians and they were looking at the same stars and navigating the same way we do today. So just by what we observe and see, we are not a spinning ball in outer space and then flying through an endless space. That's just nonsense. Well, let me ask you a question. And, and we're going to get to a lot of that more in detail when we, when we both do our, our debate discussions. One of the things I have a hard time with is, you know, 
Look, I get the government lies. One of the hard things about the flat earth idea, what I would call a flat earth theory, is there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are true that I believe in, right? There's, there's no doubt about that. And so it's almost like an us and them. You guys are the few enlightened people of reality, whereas I would say, well, of course I know the election was stolen. Of course I know that vaccines are nonsense. Of course I didn't close my church. We even put up a sign that said we're a mask-free campus. We won't even allow you to wear a mask here. And so it's not like we're into all of the stuff, right? And so it, it, it seems like with this, you know, us versus them football mentality that we're tackling each other over some of the same issues because, yeah, there's a lot of things that you and I agree on. But then it's like you got to keep going deeper in the conspiracies and keep going deeper. And now you, you can agree with me on all these things, but if you don't agree about the flat earth theory, the flat earth model and concept, well, then you don't really understand the Bible. I'm not saying you can't be saved. I don't believe you would believe that either. You don't really understand the word. Uh, you, you're not really enlightened like the rest of us. But then we know, you know, government, NASA lies. But here's the problem that I have. And, and probably in your presentation, you'll talk about some of those documents. I've read every one of those documents that you released. I've no, seen not yet. I see I them release some of them. Well, the I ones that yet. you have released publicly. I, I read all of them, said so I wanted to be very thorough. But here's the issue. NASA bad, NASA bad, NASA bad. But these NASA documents that I just released tell you that NASA's telling the truth. So I don't understand the discrepancy. And I'm just oh, being honest about that. Well, it's simple. When these documents were top secret, meaning if you divulged the information that was in them before they were released through the Freedom of Information Act, you went to prison uh, by accused of treason, okay? So the government will hide things, like, okay, the MK Ultra program, we'll use that example. The MK Ultra program was denied by our government for decades and decades and decades. They, Operation Paperclip, after World War II, they brought all the Nazi scientists over here, gave them immunity, and they basically started the mind control program through the, it's called MK Ultra, it's called uh, Ar Operation Artichoke, Mockingbird, right? So all of this was done, uh, the United States government, the Canadian government was involved, all right? All of this was kept top secret until it got leaked out in the 70s and through the church committee and it got leaked out and then they found the documents buried in the, um, the CIA headquarters and they had destroyed, matter of fact, the CIA director, Alan Dulles, had destroyed about 200,000 documents trying to c cover it up. But they found some hidden in another office. So all the truth came out. So what I'm saying is the truth came out in the 70s. And finally, actually, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, actually apologized because experiments were done on human beings, mind control using drugs and, and physical abuse and sexual abuse and sometimes against people's will without their knowledge, and some people died in those experiments that the CIA was doing. Now, you could look back and go back then and say, oh, that's a, that's a conspiracy, uh, and the government, you know, the government covered it up. But when those documents come out that were kept secret, and we know, okay, they, they, they were discussing this between them, and they have to do that, and it's the same way with NASA, and it's the same way with our other government agencies and military. They don't tell us everything what they actually do and then f the freedom of information act i'm gonna tell you this i believe the freedom of information act is jesus made them do because jesus said everything done in secret and spoken in secret is going to be shouted from the rooftops <laughs> and i actually believe it's a rule that god god has made them start revealing things to us and so that's it's easy to determine and i look at a document that's top secret it was kept top secret from us for years and years and years and decades, and finally now it's released. Oh, I can go, I see why they were hiding it. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. I, I know you're going to talk a little bit about those documents, and so let me, let me just kind of move on to another question because I'm, I'm really anxious to get you hooked up and let you start doing your actual presentation and, and make sure the guys have the, the cord and the computer and all of that ready. Okay, the age-old question is, why don't you guys still have an actual map? Why do you have a model but not a scaled map? Nobody does. Do you know that all of our maps are wrong? Every single one of them. Well, we have a scale, and you can tell me that this is 200 miles apart from certain towns, and I can look at the scale well, on a the, regular map, the, and I can drive it, and it's exactly 200 miles apart. The Gleason apart. map works, works really well. And, again, you have to know how to use map. Maps have different scales and different, uh, different things that you look at. But bottom line is, is that all maps are wrong. The projection map, one of the Mercator maps show way, show Iceland like bigger than Africa, and that's not true. 
So what I'm saying is all map, nobody has a true accurate to the perfect map. That's just a fact. Not your side, not my side. We're still working on it. But we can travel based off our model and based off our map and get exactly where we want to get. But you can't do that on the model of the flat earth. No, it's not true. And even Africa is like 3,000 miles wider than it's supposed to be because right. it's looking down on a spherical earth and it's just been flattened out. It's, it's absolutely not true. Um, that, that is 100% true. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, oh. it's not. In fact, w w navigation, and I have this in my book, navigation is called the great circle navigation, not yes. the great sphere navigation. All right, so everything. Yeah, but every pilot would tell you that's an no. actual commercial airline pilot. Where's my Army pilot? Where's my Army pilot? Yeah. Stand up, Army pilot. Where are you? Okay, see. There he is. So what I'm saying is not every pilot will tell you that. I have a, a friend, good, dear friend. Commercial like, airline pilots commercial will tell pilot, you that. A commercial pilot will tell you yes. I have multiple. In fact. Because I don't want to get on a plane of a guy that doesn't know about the rotation of the earth because I'll end up in the wrong place. That's the entire idea because of Because this is what, okay, it's a, it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. All right, if, if, you, if you believe the earth is spinning and if you believe in the Coriolis effect that I, you have to do I that. definitely believe in the Coriolis well, effect. It's not even in the, in the SEAL manual, and I have a SEAL friend. So what I'm going to tell you right now is that if that was happening, you could not land a plane on a north-south runway because if the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour and an airplane is flying at 500 miles an hour and you have to count in velocity and you have to figure all that in, they could not land on a north-south runway. It's impossible. Gyroscopes in planes tell the, the pilot that they're flying flat and level, and many, many pilots have come out. An F-16 pilot's come out and a whistleblower and said, it's flat, he knows it. Here's another thing. You see a F-16, I've been in down in Pensacola where you see the Blue Angels do their thing. They will fly 50 feet off of the water, breaking the sound barrier, okay? Now, that means that they are moving over 700 miles an hour, right? They break the sound barrier. Sometimes they're flying at Mach 2 in a straight line. Now, if they're flying that fast and the Earth's curving, and most people don't, on, on your side do not know how much the Earth curves. They don't even know the, the formula. But it's 8 inches per mile squared. Now, if you do that going that fast, you're going to have to be nosing the plane down. In fact, if you're going 500 miles an hour, you're going to be nosing the plane down like 2,000 feet, which is over half a mile every few minutes, right? If you're flying at Mach 2, it's incredible. They would have to be nosing the plane down continually, and pilots will tell you that they never nose their plane down to follow the curvature of the Earth. That is a fact. They, they don't have to have their nose down to follow the curvature of the earth. They fly at altitude, and altitude takes care of the curvature of the earth. That's no, the entire no, no, point no. of, no, of no. a pilot. That's how he keeps the plane in the air. Me, to to me, say that you've got to nose down and go around the earth would be about, Let me explain something to you about aerodynamics. Aerodynamics will tell you right now you cannot fly a plane at Mach 2. You cannot fly a plane in any curve. I don't care if it's this way this way or this way, they do not fly. They will come apart. That's why the SR-71, there was one time, it just came to pieces. It had to fly straight and level or it would just burn up and tear apart. So, no, I'm sorry. They don't nose a plane down. So you've flying. never seen a plane curve? You've never seen a plane do flips, go up, go down, barrel roll? You hear, you, no, no, what you're talking about is you're going somewhere else with this. That's different. When I'm talking about a plane flying at Mach 1, Mach 2, Mach 3. They're, they're not nosing the plane down. I, yeah, but I don't, I don't travel to go preach at Mach 1, Mach 2. I'm, I'm talking about real people understanding the, the science behind this, not just speculations of being able to say, well, a lot of pilots have come out. Well, I would like to see one of them. Because they're here. They got one here. They're, they're not. They're, they're not here. He, he, he just said he wasn't a military pilot. Got heli Listen, these are the people. That guy right there. The these white are the, shirt. These hold, are on, the, hold on now. The white shirt guy. Commercial a, airline pilot? An army pilot. Commercial airline pilot? What difference does it make? Because <laughs> the people that want to talk are helicopter pilots are the only flat earthers I've ever met. And I've only met three of them, which is fine. And then people that fly small planes for small distances because if you're going to get in an airplane, and I know you guys hate the southern hemisphere and all that kind of stuff, I I'm telling you, there is no possible way to make it from point A to point B without curvature and rotation of the earth. It's an impossibility. Now, I know your side does not believe in that, but to say that you guys have professional surveyors, 
that survey map. I'm not talking about little bitty areas hold on, hold or on. pilots. Okay, let me bring this up. You, since you bring up surveyors, geolog U.S. Geological Survey yep. is very clear that they don't even count curvature over 100 square miles. Well, you know what? That's about foolish because either they don't know. They count it as flat over 100 square miles. They count the earth as flat. Do you know how much curvature is at 100 miles supposed to be there? Well, we have a surveyor in the room tonight. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm asking you. Do you know how much curvature of the earth is supposed to be there in 100 miles? Well, if you use the parabolic approximation, which is the zetetic astronomy, which is nonsense because that's a curve as an arch. It would look like the world would look like the St. Louis arch. No, you're, that's, that's, that is not it. Every scientist, I have a PhD in physics here with me that's highly sought after across the world by Google and NIH and everything else. She will tell you that if you're going to have a ball that's 24,901 miles in circumference, and it's a perfect sphere, right? You have a sphere, and that's what NASA shows us is a perfect sphere, though Neil deGrasse Tyson says it's a pear-shaped thing, right? But here we go. Here, here we go. If you have a sphere. It's not a perfect sphere, but I get it. Go ahead. Well, that's the pictures they give us, so somebody's wrong. But here's the thing. If it's curving, if it's a, if it's a sphere, 24,901 miles, the math does not lie. It is eight inches per mile squared at the equator. And actually, if you go up the ball, going east and west, it actually increases to nine and a quarter, nine and a half. It actually, the curve gets worse. So no, these are things we can calculate and, and they're not arguing. I have, I have engineers and PhDs in physics who will explain to you the math if you need to explain to you. But I don't know where you're coming from with that crazy stuff. The Earth, if it is the ball. Uh, it comes right out of the Zetetic Astronomy book from Samuel Robotham. No, 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 it doesn't. I don't, who, I, I've never even read his book. Okay. No, this math is very clear. It's, it's, it's as clear as it gets. Where, where's my PhD in physics? Please stand. What's... The square. I'm going to just ask you to raise your hand. Is an approximation. Does the Earth, if it's a sphere curving 24,901 miles of circumference, does, is that an average of 8 inches per mile squared? Yes. Right. But the square is an approximation, yes or no? No. Absolutely. And it, it is. It's 7.9 inches. It's accurate. It's very accurate. So, like I said, it's, it's, that's a PhD in physics. Now, if you want to go, she does experiments at Tuskegee University in Alabama. And like I said, she knows what she's talking about. So I, that's why I brought these people, because we're not going to go down this, these, these crazy roads. I mean, the math is math. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the math is not in your favor. And so, I mean, yeah, anybody could bring testimonies, anybody bring Greek doctors, PhDs, that's fine. But the squared is an approximation. It's a parabolic approximation for an arch. That's 100% the facts. No. Nope. That's 100% that's no, true. No, no, no. It's not. Uh, it is. It is not. If you draw a circle, you can figure out how much it's curving. Yeah. So at the end of the day, so at the end of the day, parabolic approximation, it is an approximation, but the question still has to be answered regardless of how off our maps are, which we can navigate very well with them. Why is there no real map? For the model of the flat earth. Why is there no curvature when we go out with high zoom cameras? That's not what I asked. No, no, I, I can ask whatever I want to ask. I, I, look, look, I don't agree with you about that. I know, is that's, that? I just want an answer to the question. Is there an actual map that can be produced like we have a map? We don't have a model. We have a map and an entire model that can be made predictions off of. I've already answered the question. I'm there not are no again. predictions I'm not answering again. that okay. can be made all the from maps, a flat earth model. All the maps are wrong. All the maps are wrong. All the maps are wrong. All the maps are wrong, and they know it. So They're then why isn't your map wrong when you say Antarctica encircles the entire disk and the North Pole is right in the middle? Mm -hmm. well, why isn't your map wrong, but our map is wrong, but the model proves that all the predictions for our map are 1,000% correct? They're not. The early, listen, you got to understand that there are people, that's why they don't. I do understand. That's why I'm asking you the question. You interrupted me. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to do this interruption thing, all right? I'm not. So we can just go to a presentation and we're going to do this. I'm not doing it. I just want you to answer the question. No, no, I'm not doing it. Why not? I'm not going to do this interrupt because I start giving an answer, you interrupt me. No, I'm answer the question. It. I'm not doing it. I'll give you 30 seconds of silence. Why do you not have a map or a model that can make predictions? Why? We do. 
We do. And I want to tell you, it's been very accurate. The astrolabe is another instrument that's, that's proved this. It's based on a flat, non-rotating Earth. The astrolabe, that's how they navigated seas long before we got to this nonsense, okay, about their spinning ball thing. It's always been based on, even the compass itself is based on a flat, circular Earth. Not, it, it, it doesn't work if you're down here. It's not pointing through the ball. So what I'm saying is, is that bottom line, that, that, is not even, that is not even the argument. The argument is not there. We, we know there's discrepancies in the maps. And the early explorers who went into the Arctic region, who used the instruments that they had based on a sphere, trying to, they would always find themselves out of reckoning, they said, sometimes extreme out of reckoning when they went there. I document all this, Captain, Captain Ross and all these others. I document captain after captain after captain who before they had to lie and before there was NASA that when you go into the southern part, the southern hemisphere, if that's what you want to call it, when you go there that they are out of reckoning trying to base their navigation on a sphere. That's, that's documented history. Well, I mean, you can make a dead man say anything, so it's easy to talk about what used to happen back then. We have more technology now than the world's ever imagined, and it's growing every day. So why can't you do those same things now? Why do you always have to talk about these people that used to try to do this? Did you know right now there's between one and 5,000 people on the continent, the continent of Antarctica? And, and people are like, well, you know, NASA's there, and there's these, you know, gunny penguins that are keeping people from getting it. It's just, it's this fantastical nonsense where people have flown over it, taken pictures, you know, people have circumnavigated. All of these people have circumnavigated Antarctica. Y you can buy a cruise ticket. All right. You can buy a cruise ticket and go to Antarctica. And here's what's interesting. In 2019, the Flat Earth folks were going to take a cruise to Antarctica to prove their thoughts. Nothing ever came of it. Here's a, here, let me explain that to you. You can right. fly there today. Uh, no, no, you can yeah, fly there and see the coastline. That's about all you can do, a little bit of oh, the coastline. Oh, absolutely not. No, oh, yes, oh, yes. And if you want to go there and stay, oh, no, you have to be, have permission from a government. Have you ever seen the amount of stuff you have to fill yes. out to go through there? Yes. And also, they're not going to let you go on an expedition inland just as a, just as a uh, you know, me or you. They're not going to let that happen. And, and here's another thing. If, you know, this would be easy to prove, but they, they hide this from us too. All we'd have to prove is, is, is go to Antarctica. If, let me and you go to Antarctica, spend a week there in the summer. And let's see if the sun does a 360-degree circle all the way around us. If so, it's a ball. But if the sun comes in this way and then leaves that way, then it's not. It is what we say it is. And there's been, they've had, they have, they have, Webcam videos, right, you, in Antarctica, and there'll be a flagpole that's in there. And, and, the, and so if the sun's coming in this way, you should have a shadow here, and then it comes in, and it should be here, and then it comes over here, and then it should just be back here. What they do is they never let you see 24 hours a day. They never let you. They, they cut the tape, they edit it, and Jaren of Jarenism actually has emails from them asking why are you cutting the video and they give him these stupid ex explanations like oh well it's too cold we can't run it for 24 hours we can run it for 16 to 18 hours we can't run it for 24 so hours. all the footage is doctored is that yeah, what it's saying? Doctored, and they admit it's doctored so then why can't we go and just see it for ourselves well let's just let's just see if they'll let us uh, oh they will let us i've already checked into it right. they'll absolutely let us well, let's go they'll I'll they go. will absolutely let us and not only will they absolutely let us, I've got a cattle rancher in Texas that will pay for the entire trip. Let's do it. We'll fly right to Antarctica. We stay one week inland. They're going to let us stay one week inland. Oh, absolutely. There's people inland right now. Well, yeah, they all work for different governments of the world. Nah, you can't, you, you can't, you don't get to use the governments of the world. There's Antarctica a lot of people. Antarctica Treaty, man. Antarctica Treaty. Read it. Uh, you know what? I did every line of it, and none of it has anything to do with militarization of the area. It even says peaceful expedition. One there are people guy, that live in Antarctica right now. tried to go there by himself, and he was seized and arrested and put in jail. All right? So don't tell me that. We, you can't just So decide. you expect me to change my entire theology over one man that got turned away? Go ahead. I'll tell you what. That's crazy, Train. Why don't you try? 
Oh, to I go will. there by yourself. Absolutely. All right. I, well, so, no, no, no. You agreed to without, go with me. Without government approval. You agreed to go with me. Go over there without filling out the forms and see what happens. Why would I go without filling out the forms when I can plainly fill out the forms, buy a ticket, and go, and they will let me in? All I say is don't talk about it until it's done. You, you hadn't proved a thing. It's been done. No, no, no. Over and over and over Look, and taking, being done right now. If you hadn't been there, then you're just taking the word of people. You hadn't been there. Just like you taking the word of people about space. You hadn't been to space, so you don't know it's real. You just have faith in people that are telling you a story. Okay. I mean, we play that game all day long. So th there's nothing I can believe about anything because I've not done it. I've not been there. If you can't witness it with your own eyes, you have to be able to question it. That's ridiculous because the Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And if you deny the reality because you can't see God, therefore you don't worship God, that's heresy. And we're not even on the same Christian page. Look at this. What do you mean, look at this? Your people are just... We're as... talking about the physical world, and then you start talking about God. That's not what we're talking about. If there is no physical, physical world without world, God. The physical world is what we're talking about. We're not talking we about... We are talking about the physical world. The if... heavens declare the glory of God. Have you been to outer space? I don't have to go to outer space. I've but got you a believe in telescope. It. I can look at it. You be... Oh, my gosh. Okay. Is this what we're doing? I'm going to tell you, Greg, I'm not doing this. Uh, this, this because right, you have no answers. I have given you plenty of answers. Stop. Let, hold on, hold on. Let, we're stopping right now. Hold on a second. I didn't come here to have an argument, okay? I came here to have a, de a, a debate where we look at the Scriptures. So we're going to look at the Scriptures. I'm going to tell you right now. We got to set the tone before we look at the scriptures because we got to get through all this crazy train nonsense so we can understand what the Bible crazy actually train says. Nonsense. All right, we're spinning. We're spinning a thousand miles an hour. We're flying at 66,000 miles an hour. 67. It, they change it regularly. 500,000 miles an hour is through your space that you believe in, and yet our, star, I don't, I don't go, our listen, stars never change. I know our the Earth the rotates star. one time a day, 1,000 miles, 1,000 miles stars, an hour, and I believe in the 66. I don't know about all this, the whole galaxies. It, there are people in this room that believe the Earth is stationary but want to convince me of upward acceleration instead of gravity. That's not true. Nobody believes that. There's sure nobody they do. believes that that I know. No, nobody believes in upward acceleration in the form of to misplaced no. gravity. Do you hear it? No, we don't. No. 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 That's the Flat Earth Society. They're controlled opposition. They believe a bunch of nonsense like a pancake. So the Flat Earth Society. So that is not what we believe. Okay. So y'all don't get along with the Flat Earth Society. No. They're, what do you call them, shields? Yeah. Exactly. So, okay, look. I, this this is what I have a hard time with. There are like nine different models or beliefs about flat Earth, and I don't understand who's right, who's wrong. Why is flat Earth society wrong? But why are you guys correct? You know, you see what I'm saying? That's what I don't understand. And so, just shouting things is not going to help. The reason people can't fathom this is because there's so many different belief systems about it. Whereas we have one model that works. Yeah, because you've been brainwashed with it since you were born. That's why you have one model. That's what they wanted you to believe. But listen, we can go back. We can go, okay, we can go back to the scientists who, who believed, you know, the people that, that, that y'all look to for this, you know, that created this. I don't look to any of them. Copernicus and all them. Look, they were thinking the sun was 3 million miles away. Then it was 12 million miles away. Now it's 93 million miles away. So don't tell me about models. You guys have been working on this That's thing. because there's technological advancements across yeah, yeah, the ages. But again, it's been changing all the time. And I don't believe the, the sun's 93 million miles away at all. Well, in I fact, understand that. In fact, there's evidence to prove that it's not. So what I'm getting at is we can do, like I said, we can do this little argument right here all day long, but I didn't come to, I didn't come to argue like this. I mean, I mean, maybe you want to make a show out of it, but I'm not here to argue like... I, I just want to answer the questions that I don't have the answers to, that I'm trying to figure out. Well, I gave... They're I, very simple questions. Very... very I, I, you know, no, no, you're not going to play... Look, here's what you're doing. You're playing this little game here with me. You don't have an answer. You don't have an answer. For because why. I'm not a flat earther. Hold, no, hold on. Hold on. You don't, I'm talking about your model. You do not have an answer as to why we've been flying through this ever-expanding universe at 500 million. Uh, oh, I do have an answer. Hold on. And the stars never change in our view, ever. That's not true. That is true. That is true because I've been, I've been looking at it for a long time. It is true. Well, go to the southern hemisphere and look at the same ones. 
Yeah, I've looked at it. I know. You've been in the southern hemisphere. Yes, I have. And, and you've looked up. Can yes. you see Polaris from the southern hemisphere? Sometimes you can. It depends. You but, never can. Uh, no, no, no. To you a never certain, can. Sorry, to, to a certain degree south, you can. But here's the thing. In our model, the biblical model, I believe and we believe that both the sun and the moon are much smaller and much lower and closer to the earth, as well as the stars. Same so size. So we, we don't, yeah, we believe they're the same size. And we don't, believe, we don't believe the stars are some distant galaxies that are trillions of miles away. Right. We believe the stars are much closer. So when things are smaller and closer, when you move away from them, you don't get to see them because of perspective. It's anything like I've got, a, I've got a video, I'll show you in a minute, where a guy puts his camera on the ground on a flat football field, and he starts walking away from it. Well, he starts walking away from it, his feet disappear first. And then he gets up to his knees and then up to his waist. And then by the time he's at the end of the football field, he can squat down, you can't see him. He hadn't left the flat football field. Right? It's a matter of perspective. And so what happens is like the sun doesn't go down. It doesn't go around the curve. It just simply gets too far away for us to see because it's lower and smaller and it gets further away. And it's actually what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say, you know, the King James will say the sun goes up and down. If you look the word up, it's bow in the Hebrew and it means just to come in and go out. That's all it means. Like to walk in, it says like to walk in the front door and walk out the back door. It's not talking about going over a curve. And so again, that's what I'm talking about. Our model, and, and, and that's what we get at. I, I'm not, you, you, you try to take your model and apply stuff to it to ours. They're completely different. Oh, As, they're way different. There's no doubt about that. They're there, completely there's no doubt. different. And I'm, I'm not trying to amalgamate the two. There is no amalgamation in them, okay? I, 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 there's no way I can believe that the sun and moon are the same size and they're, what, 32 miles wide? Is that something like that? Like 3,000 miles? Why, why can't I go out in the middle of the night and get a telescope and find the sun. You can't because every instrument, I don't care what we have. I don't care if it's the most powerful instrument you've got. It has a limit to its vision. I have, most of us in here have a P900. Yeah, I have a but, P900. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about like a telescope. Yeah, we've used telescopes. We've used. So why can't I find the sun if it's only 3,000 miles it's away? It's too far away. And it's moving. It's How moving can it be a, too It's far moving 1,000 miles an hour and it's moving too far away. Again, it's perspective. It's like anything. I don't care. You can drive a car down the road. And sooner or later, it's, even if you're in New Mexico or Arizona, sooner or later, it's going to disappear from your vision, though it's still on the road. It's still going. And then you can take a high zoom camera and you can pull it back in and catch it again. But eventually, as it keeps going, it's going to get out of the range of that high zoom camera or telescope. They're not. Every telescope and every camera, no matter how powerful its, its optical abilities, it still has a limit to it. So it's, it runs out. And so what happens to us, we have a convergence. The way we see things, everything goes down like this to a point. That's why when you see a plane, a plane can be flying at us from this direction, and it can be maintaining an altitude of 40,000 feet. But when you're looking at it coming at you, it's going to be low on the horizon. Then it's going to look like it's high above your head. As it goes over you, your eyes are seeing it as it's going down this way, and it's never changed altitude. That's the same with the sun or the moon or the stars. It can't be the same with the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's an impossibility. And, and you I disagree. Can't, I disagree. You, I disagree. I disagree. You, you can't have a, a, a sun and a moon that are the same size and stay in the exact whatever, if y'all use the phrase orbit, in the exact same orbit, in the exact same path, in the exact... The, it's an impossibility to have that. There's, there's no way in that model... You don't understand the that model. ...that that scientifically... I don't understand the model because it doesn't work. Well, our, our government sure thinks it works. It, well, how works. does our government think it works? They tell you everything. They even base their aircraft flying off a of non-rotating flat earth. They programmed it. Listen, I have a document from 1962. Now, we already had satellites, right, in 1958, first satellite, echo satellite. They, <laughs> this is funny, they tell us that it had a hundred, uh, uh, basically a hundred yard mylar balloon and it went into outer space. Yeah, right. Here's the thing, 1961, 62, I have a document that was classified, meaning that if you exposed it, you were going to prison. In that document, it says that two NASA scientists, rocket scientists, programmed their IBM computer to track missiles in space based on a non-rotating flat Earth. And that document was classified. 
Now, they program their computers. So if it's not flat and non-rotating, why on earth would two rocket scientists from NASA program their computer to track a missile in space that way? So when I say the government believes it, because they have to build things to work the way the earth really is and the way the system really is, but they just don't tell you that. You have to dig and find that out. Well, we have a, a military guy. How many military folks do we have in the building on either side? If you're military, stand up. If you're military, stand up all over the room. Thank you for your service. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Do you then, any of you on, on your side, and I'm asking politely, do you deny the reality that our government has spent billions of dollars on over-the-horizon missile systems? Why would they build over-the-horizon <laughs> missile systems unless they were going to shoot them over the horizon for the curvature of the earth for an enemy that you can't see? Right, here's a fact. Have you interviewed a, uh, I interviewed a guy named Sean. He's in my book. Uh, he's a, he was a Sparrow missile instructor for the Navy. And I interviewed him and I said, tell me about your laser weapon on your ship. Now the Navy has a laser weapon. I actually have the article, I actually have it in this. The Navy has a laser weapon that is clearly lasers or line of sight. They don't bend over a curve. Yeah, but I'm talking about the ones that do. I, I, I'm, no, no. Look, over you, can the shoot, you can shoot, okay, let's, let's, let's say I give you your alleged curve. Yes, you can shoot a projectile up in the air over a curve and then make it land where you want to. Mm -mm. All right, hold on. I'm talking about shooting it straight across no, no, and going no, no, around no, they the don't curvature shoot. of the earth. Nothing does this. A laser doesn't do this. The, I'm not asking about a laser. I'm telling you about a weapon system. Now, you want to talk about your weapon system, I want to talk about mine. All right? But I asked you about mine because I asked the question. And I just said, I don't know exactly what weapon you're talking about. I'm being specific. What weapon are you talking about? Over the horizon missile system, mm -hmm. which is a missile that shoots across the ground over the horizon because of the curvature of the earth and hits an intended target that you can't see because of the curvature of the earth. Okay. Hear what I'm about to say. I don't care about that. I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you what. No, 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 no. Don't interrupt me. Because if you interrupt me, we're, we're just going to be done. Because I'm not going to be interrupted. Uh, we were done when we got started, I can <laughs> tell you that. But you, you know. My brother is a lieutenant colonel in the military. Okay? My friend, lieutenant colonel. Then Brian, I want him no, to no, stand on, up and I want him to publicly deny over the horizon missile no, no, systems no, 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 no. in Listen, the United States military. Let's stop right there. All right. I'm going to tell you about a laser because we know lasers are line of sight weapons. Right. My lieutenant colonel friend... He, uh, he actually speaks fluent Russian, taught at West Point, and will tell you that they're, not only are there radar, but laser weapons are line of sight weapons. The Navy admits on, in their defense magazine that their laser weapon that has no curvature to it whatsoever, it's not curving, can shoot down Russian and Chinese cruise missiles flying 50 feet over the water over 100 miles away. Now, let me explain to you what 100 miles is, because you didn't, you didn't know a minute ago what curvature is supposed to be there at 100 miles, I'll tell you. If the Earth is a sphere 24,901 miles in circumference, the 8 inches per mile squared on average means that in 100 miles, there should be 6,666 feet of curvature. That's well over a mile of curve. There is no laser weapon shooting from a Navy ship doing this to hit a missile moving at Mach 4. I'm sorry, but the Navy admits by that the Earth is level and non-rotating. I, I can assure you the United States military does not admit that the Earth is flat. And if it does, <laughs> then how come you can't trust them, but now you can trust them? You see, you only trust people... I already people. answered that question. You only trust people that are on your side. You never trust anybody that has an opposing side. Not true. That 100% true. I've listened, to, I've listened to all kinds of people about this stuff. I've interviewed all kinds of people. I guarantee you I've done far more research than you have on this issue. Oh, I guarantee you after this debate, I'll never research this foolishness again. I can promise you that right now. Well, see, that means you've already made up your mind. I have made up my mind because I'm about to show you from the Bible God's made up his mind. I love to see that. Well, you're about to. Because I know you can't do but it. But you get to go first. So get your computer and get that thing hooked up because I got a lot of questions I could ask.
get his up, up uh, front to me. This is my hey, um power just okay. Yes. She couldn't find the... Mm -hmm. Where's the... Uh Sorry? He's holding it. What's that? Okay, okay. And I got as long as I need, right? I have no idea exactly, at least. All right. No, that's fine. Yeah, it's been having that problem. All right. Well, that's laser system 2014. What is it? Line of sight laser system started in 2014. They can name it whatever they want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's totally different. Yeah. So are we... You got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> huh? So was it... Boom, working. Huh? I need my water there. Don't worry about it. It, it. If it is, we got two hours anyway, so. Yeah. We're all happy to have you as our pastor. <laughs> all right, everybody. We I think we're ready to get started here. Um, And I'm going to show some things. I'm going to go through. I actually have a lot of slides, but I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, what's that? Let's pray. I agree with that. Father in heaven, we come to you today, and we just thank you for this time, and we thank you for this opportunity. We just open, uh, Lord, just pray you just open hearts and minds right now to hear your word for what it says. It's not metaphors and uh, similes and illustrations that, Lord, your word, you said exactly what you meant about how the earth is and how your universe is, and we believe that, God, and we thank you for it. 
And we just pray for your peace and your truth right now to go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me just go ahead and state this out front. When it comes to the Bible, it's without question a flat, non-rotating, geocentric earth. That's just the way it is. The only way the other side gets to make it a spinning, flying sphere is that they have to say, oh, those passages about the pillars of the earth and the foundation of the earth and the earth doesn't move, that that is just uh, metaphors. That's just poetry. But folks, I'm going to read this scripture here. We're going to read a few scriptures first to start off with. And this is 2 Peter 1, 16 through 20. You guys can put it on the screen for everybody. Let's read this. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is a, of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now here's the other scripture we're going to go through. All scripture, the Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture... Even the parts that they want to call metaphors and poetry. And I think Pastor Greg called one, he said, hyperbole. But hyperbole means exaggeration and lies. And God doesn't do that. Uh, the Bible doesn't use those things. God means what he says. Now, there's, few, there's symbolic language. I'll say, like, for instance, let's, let's talk about a symbolic language. The Bible talks about a seven-head, ten-horned beast in the book of Revelation and in Daniel, right? But that seven-head, ten-horned beast we find out is a literal thing. It's going to be a world government. In fact, the United Nations has already become that, a seven-head, ten-horned beast. You have the five on the permanent council. You have the P5 plus one, which is Germany, which is six, and then the EU head comes in when they have a serious problem like the, the Iranian nuclear deal. So you have seven heads, and then under that, you have ten rotating positions. So literally, the UN that's going to end up being a world government has already seven heads and ten horns. So even though there's symbolic language at times in the Bible, it's talking about something that's real, okay? And that was what we need to agree on. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So the moment somebody says, well, the, what, what the Bible says in the book of Job or whatever about creation doesn't matter, no, it matters because it's profitable for doctrine, Right? See, the thing about it is I'm not going to have to do theological jumping jacks to agree with the secular system about how the creation is. I can just stick with the Word of God, all right? Now, when he says here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This one right here, Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, we are told, this is in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, that, that Satan would deceive the whole world. How is it that we think that Satan, who is invisible, who has power, who actually has people who serve him in the government, in the militaries of the world, how is it that we think if we gave him $60 million a day, which is NASA's budget, that he couldn't deceive the whole world with something? And we know from the Bible that the number one way we know there's a creator and that leads us to a creator, it says that we're without excuse, is the creation. So if you were the devil and you wanted to lead people away from the Bible and finding Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you would need to twist the creation story to make it completely wrong and get people to believe that your version of it is right and the Bible's is wrong, all right? But that's exactly what Satan has done. Now, people, all Christians, when they come up, they ask, well, why does this matter? Well, we're going to find out in just a second, but here's another verse. People don't talk about conspiracy. Look, there's conspiracy theories and then there's conspiracy facts. 
Lord, when they tell you, like, for instance, they're going to make a vaccine, well, Bill Gates said this in 2010. He said, when they say, oh, yeah, we're going to lower the population of the world through new vaccines. Now, they just told you what they're going to do, but most people can't even believe that. But it's already been happening. Now, the Bible says there's going to be a massive plot, a massive conspiracy against the God of the Bible and his Messiah, Jesus Christ. We read it right here, Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens, though, shall laugh and shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So he tells us here that the evil, and this is the last day's context. He's going to talk about the Messiah coming and ruling with a rod of iron. Jesus is going to return and fix everything, right? But he tells us that the kings of the earth are going to take counsel. And actually the Amplified says they're going to bring together a plot. And yes, so they're all in on it. Every lie that's out there, folks, whether it be about creation, I mean, or, or whatever, every lie out there is to turn people away from the truth of God's word. You understand? That's what, that's what this is over. We can sit here and argue maps and models and I have my military experts and he has his. We can argue this stuff all day long. But the bottom line is the fruit, the fruit of what's going on. And does the Bible say it? But there is a plot. Now let me show you part of where that plot is. Let's go to Romans. Here we go to Romans. He says here, this is Romans 1, 18 through 20. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. Now this word in the Greek, hold, means to hold down, suppress, withhold. He says that there are men who withhold the truth because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So he tells us here that part of the plot, remember Acts, I mean, Psalm 2, we just read, part of the plot is this hiding the truth about creation, suppressing it. They know there's a firmament. They tried to blow it up in the 1960s with Operation Fishbowl. Glad it didn't work, right? Now let's keep going here. Oh, my bad, wrong one. Here we go. Now, this is what Pastor Greg said when his first rant here. He said, I don't care about biblical cosmology. There is no such thing. It's man-made. A few minutes later, he said, I want to be fair to that side because... We've been lied to in a bunch of other areas does not mean we've been lied to about the shape and cosmology of the earth. Well, is cosmology a thing or is it not a thing? I just wonder it. But cosmology is simply the definition. Cosmology is the science of the universe. Cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole from its origin. And, of course, they use the term evolution. We don't believe in evolution. But they, it's, it's about the origin of the universe. All right? This is what it's about. Now, the world system has their version of this they believe in a big bang that nothing exploded and created everything right which that's that's to me is mind-blowing how they believe this um but this is their thing it's the next let me see did i do it right there? that one right there so their big bang look at that they're at billions of years these galaxies and stars and all this stuff this is their version but this is not god's version now let me ask you a question we, we would think it's ridiculous now. Um, like modern science. Modern science says that we evolved from the primordial goo and these creatures came along and then we finally became primates and then we finally, after millions and zillions of years, we, we evolved from primates or monkeys. Now, why as Christians do we not believe that? Number one, there is no evidence. If there was millions of years of this transitional phase, there would be skeletons and fossils of this transitional phase. So number one, there's no evidence that we can see. And the Bible clearly teaches that we didn't come from monkeys over millions and billions of years. Now, we don't believe the scientists. Scientists would get up here and tell you it's a fact that we came from monkeys. But we don't accept that. But then we're going to accept their version. You say, well, I've heard people say, well... I believe in the Big Bang. God made a Big Bang and that's the way it was. No, no. He tells us exactly how he created the earth in Genesis, in Job, in Psalms. He tells us exactly how he did it. 
Um, and it's important. You say, well, why is it important? Well, let me show you something before we get to that. Let me show you what Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of our top astrophysicists, and Michio Kaku tell us. These are your scientists. There is a crisis in cosmology. Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of ten, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of ten. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of ten to the one hundred and twenty. That is one with a hundred and twenty zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. Dark matter. I get asked what it is, and my best answer is, we haven't a clue. <laughs> we don't know what it is. We look out in the universe, and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste, and it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really, we should be calling it the dark force, because we don't know if it's made of matter. It could be a profound misnomer, sending people off in thought directions that might not really be uh, the right path. So dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing, responsible for 85% of the gravity of the cosmos. We've known about dark matter since the 1930s. Back then, it was called missing mass. That's what it was called, because, yeah, there's got to be some mass. Where is it? We can't find it. It's got to be here somewhere, because we got the gravity. If you have the gravity, you got to have the mass. Mass and gravity go together. Uh, it's really dark gravity. Actually, we shouldn't call it anything. We should call it Fred, <laughs> something that has no meaning, because we don't know what it is to call it. But it, has been a, it is the longest-standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Now, here's two of your top scientists in the world telling you that on cosmology, they're off by 10 with 120 zeros beside it. Then they start telling you for our model to work, this all this gravity nonsense and spinning and flying things, they said, it's got to have a certain amount of gravity, but we don't know, it doesn't have that. Our, what they're saying is that, that our whole system we built makes no sense to us, it doesn't work. And I will tell you why they call it missing mass. The missing mass is called the firmament, you're going to see that in a second. That's what they miscalculate. But I want to share you with you this here, and we're going to skip ahead here. I've already talked about this. This is what is called the Hebrew concept of the universe. This is what the Bible teaches. All right? And we'll get back to this in just a second, but it shows you that this is what the firmament is, the dome structure over the flat, non-rotating earth. Hell is beneath, heaven is above that, God's throne sits on that. This is what the Bible teaches. There's all of the scriptures around that. We're going to get to that in a second. So more like that, not that. In fact, that sphere you're looking at there is a, <laughs> it's a composite image. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible describes a solid firmament dome covered the flat earth on set on pillars on a foundation that God himself built. Nothing in the Bible describes the earth as a sphere. All right, and I'm going to show you that and I'm going to prove that. But many Christians ask, why does it matter? Or just say the issue of the nature of creation doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you why it matters. And you're going to see this. Now, before we get to that, I want you to see Jesus said this. This is Matthew 24. This is Jesus talking. These are in your red letters here. Jesus said that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven. He didn't say meteorites, comets. He said the stars. It's the same word he used throughout the Bible for the stars. Now, either they're stars or they're not stars. Now, the heliocentric Copernican model that you guys, some of you want to believe in, says that the stars out there are, bigger, are, are massive, bigger than the earth. They're, they're huge things. That If one fell to the earth, it would swallow the earth. So Jesus did not teach a Copernican cosmology. He taught a biblical cosmology and that the stars are smaller, closer, and are going to fall to the earth. 
Now that's Jesus in the Bible. And if you say that it's not the stars, it's some meteorites or comets or whatever, you're making up stuff because you are filtering that through a bias you've been brainwashed with from birth. All right? The Bible says the stars. Now, I was talking to a person who was a science teacher who's a, a strong Christian, and I said, I said, what about the stars falling to the earth? And he goes to, to Revelation 6, and he says, well, don't you think that's just what, what John was seeing was asteroids and meteorites falling? It wasn't really stars. And I said, well, I said, you got a problem with that if you're going to say it's just asteroids and meteorites because Jesus said it was stars. So did Jesus know what he was talking about or not? So here's a place that seriously the Bible does not agree with the cosmology of this world system, NASA and everybody else. And what's amazing to me, let me just say this, what's amazing to me is that Christians have tried to mix the world system cosmology into Christianity and they don't work. You can't do it. And this is proof of that right here and I'm going to show you what the atheists do. Now let's listen to this. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson again, one of your top astrophysicists, astronomers, and here's what he says about this issue of the stars, the Bible saying the stars fall in. People who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature. That's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. In fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. To even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. I have known serious religious people, not fundamentalists, who were scared when Carl Sagan opened his series with the words, The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. But that scared them, because they interpret that to mean, then if this is it, there's nothing else, no God and no life after. For, for religious people, many people say, well, God is within you, or yeah. God, there are ways that people have shaped this, rather than God is an old gray-bearded man in the clouds. So if God is within you, what I'm sure Carl would say, in you, in your mind, in your mind, and we can measure the neurosynaptic. Okay. 
Now we're going to move on from him. But you understand, see, you say, why does it matter? Because people have believed this instead of believing what God's word said, and many people have fallen away. They've walked away. People have said, I'm, I'm not following God anymore. I'm not even Christian. I, I watched a thing this, this week where even many Bible scholars are departing because they accept science as God. It's like it's infallible instead of trusting God's word. Let me tell you, this world is full of lies, folks. I believe they've lied about everything. I believe they've lied about the sun, moon, stars, the whole thing. I can tell you this much. I don't care how many people you brought in here. I'm going to stand with what Jesus said and the way he described it. And what's beautiful about it is every now and then he gives us the ability to prove it. And um, I have Joe Hanvey here. We may call him up, but Joe Hanvey has is is been doing some amazing experiments in photography. He has actually photographed the nebula with the stars in front of them with a with a shadow behind the stars on the nebula, showing you it's not what you've been told. Matter of fact, NASA artists do most of what you, what you think is space and planets and all this stuff is NASA artistry, and I have them admitting it. Disney, guy worked for Disney, now works for NASA. I'm going to skip this atheist right here. We're going to Now, I'm, I'm talking about how science can impact. Here's a story of how science can impact young Christians. And boy, we, do we have young Christians falling away from God left and right. And one of the reasons is they go to school, they go to college, and they start getting taught this stuff that it's not the way that the that creation is not the way God says, not the way the Bible says, and they fall away. And some, it's even worse than that, they commit suicide. Jesse Kilgore, community college student in New York, took his own life when he was just 22 years old. He was raised in a devout evangelical Christian Household was a firm believer of Christianity until he took a biology class in college, which led him to experiencing a crisis of faith. The biology professor also recommended Jesse to read The God Delusion, a book by, written by atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, an atheist biologist. As a result, reading his book and taking the biology class, he learned a lot of things which challenged and contradicted his own beliefs, which caused him to abandon his faith and ultimately take his own life. Um, this is, is sad, but it's true. And this is where we are. You could, I could give a lot of examples of this. And there's more studies. But it says right here in a, a research study on the impacts of science and the discontinuation of faith and practice in Christianity in young adults, in their observations, and this is the Center for Science and Culture did this study, they noted that 59 to 70 percent of students growing up with a Christian background will likely lose their faith or abandon their religion by the time they reach college. An example of someone who contributes to this statistic is Kyle Simpson, who had a similar story to Jesse. Like, like Jesse, Kyle was raised a Christian, but science changed his mind and beliefs when he was in his 20s. Although he did not take his own life like Jesse, Kyle decided to discontinue his faith in Christianity. So you're going to tell me it doesn't matter. Now, I want to say this tonight. I want to say hey to our atheist friends. One of the reasons I'm going down this road is because uh, here we have Owen Morgan who has about 400,000 followers, another guy, the friendly atheist who has about 100,000. They're all talking about they're going to watch this tonight. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, I'm going to show you some fruit that when people have seen the evidence for a flat, geocentric, non-rotating earth, that many atheists have seen the evidence and come to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They've come back to the faith. And I just want to say hey to them, and I appreciate them sharing on their channels that we were having this debate, and now they're laughing it up. But I want to tell you what they don't realize. They're losing a lot of their atheist friends over what we can show them. They're coming to Jesus. Now, let me share with you. Let's go to this, this right here. Now, I want to say, I'm not, I put this up because I want everybody to hear, but I'm going to read this. The many atheists have come to know God. They've come back to the Bible. They've come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they didn't do it because all of a sudden they just started believing the Bible out of the blue. Or somebody showed them something, another, another lie or another trick or another, you know, another fairy tale. I said, many atheists and scientists think that those of us who believe in a geocentric, stationary, flat earth only came to this belief via our religion or crackpot YouTube videos. 
But that is not the case. It was seeing the evidence of real experiments, doing the math, making our own conclusions from our own observations about the nature of our world that brought most of us to this understanding of creation. For 99% of us, it was after seeing the evidences that we all realized what the Bible taught, that the Bible taught these truths all along. And it is that journey of examining the evidences that show we do actually live on a geocentric, stationary, flat earth that has brought many atheists, agnostics to faith in the Bible and thus finding God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, as their creator and personal savior. Now, I want to show you we're not afraid of science. We actually go out with high zoom cameras and telescopes and lasers and actually do test in different climate time, you know, in different uh, weather and different conditions to see what we can prove. And I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. But I want to, here's a testimony that this is Paul Logberg from Sweden. He was raised an atheist, uh, became a mechanical engineer and began looking into some conspiracies and, and came across flat earth and he laughed at it. And then, well, you'll hear his story. It's only two minutes. I was an atheist 39 years, have gone, gone through universities, um, schooling, everything. Um, never had really an interest in God. Uh, never really was a God hater, but of course I had other issues like idols and stuff, and like all uh, atheists have. In Sweden, basically all uh, people are atheists, 80% atheists, 15% Muslims nowadays, and um, whatever, 5% others. I was uh, one of the atheists, of course, like all. Um, 2011, I started investigating what is wrong with the world, why is the world going absolutely crazy, land at flat earth around 2015, yes, April 2015, just laughed it off, thinking, okay, this is completely crazy. But after a month, I looked into it anyway, and uh, thought I'll get a good laugh. But no, I, I saw it right. Okay, there's no way that it's a ball. Um, and then I got interested in what does the Bible actually say? Oh, if, if it was right about that already from the start, maybe it's right about the other parts also regarding the endings. Turned out, yes, it was. Gave my life to Christ in uh, 2016. And, uh, yeah, uh, didn't look back. Um, the world is just so filled with lies, it's uh, actually quite sickening and disturbing. But uh, we have one hope, that's Jesus and his word, and I'm grateful for it. I uh, hope this helps someone. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Now, I love this. Paul flew in 2017, all six foot seven of him, flew all the way from Sweden because he wanted a pastor that believed the Bible to baptize him in water. Amen? But he's not the only one. This is Soren from Denmark. He actually heads up the Denodal Europe page now, but he was a complete atheist. I want you to hear his story. How you guys doing? My name is Soren. I'm from Denmark. I used to be an atheist up until 2015 when I mockingly began researching Flat Earth. And when I had researched that for about a year and a half, I came to the realization that we've been lied to, that the Earth was in fact a flat stationary plane and not a spinning water ball. That opened up the possibility of a creator, which in turn shattered my atheism. And while I was researching that creator, I came across videos from Pastor Dean and the late Rob Skiba. And as I was watching them, they were talking about creation, biblical creation, which matched perfectly the research I've been doing and thousands of others uh, on the true shape and nature of creation. So my trust in the Bible was restored where I before didn't have any faith why I trust the Bible when you couldn't even trust page one. Now I could trust page one. And as I continued listening to these guys, their sermons, I began to understand sin. And I understood the gospel and why Jesus had to come and die on the cross for us. Which led me to true repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And now I am a born again, spirit-filled disciple of Jesus. 
Praise be to God. So I'm forever thankful that truth in truth sets people free. And I'm forever grateful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Love from Denmark. Hallelujah. I'm sure Soren's watching right now. One more before we move on from this. This is Chelsea. She's actually here tonight. And God's done a great thing. Um, I was a staunch atheist for about 15 years. And it was a dark and despairing worldview that I wouldn't wish on anyone. But it always left me wondering what's the point. And I found this little corner of hope and mystery and the possibility of life out there. And I could fill a library with all the science fiction that I read over the years, trying to fill the void of atheism. Enter COVID, and like so many others, I asked myself, what else are they lying about? And it turns out the answer is everything. And it turns out the world is run by a bunch of Satan-loving liars who have us so bamboozled that we don't even know where we are. And it turns out that we've been living in their science fiction. You see, when you tell a story that begins with something exploding out of nothing, out of a jillion years, and a whole lot of chance, you don't need God for that story to make sense. In fact, you have to do some disingenuous gymnastics to write God into that story. But if you see that we're really living in something like a cosmic terrarium, you can't avoid the conclusion that we're in somebody's terrarium. Try to write God out of that story, I dare you. So it was only a few short steps for me from the mind-blowing realization of the flat earth to the God of the Bible. I thought, okay, there really isn't any evidence to support the heliocentric globe model, short of CGI, but why would they construct a lie at that scale, and how? The biblical worldview is the only worldview that can truly make sense of that level of deception. The level of deception that has fooled multiple generations into believing that we're on a spinning water ball in a vacuum, when everything in our experience screams the opposite. That level of deception demands that we confront the existence of evil because that's what their science fiction is and that's its purpose. People ask me, what does it matter what shape the earth is? And well, the truth always matters. No lie is benign. But I'd ask them, would they construct such a massive lie for no reason? No way. This massive lie has an equally massive purpose from beginning to end. It's the very foundation of the scientific worldview that aims to make God irrelevant. And I'd bet the farm that it plays a critical role in the great deception in the times ahead. In my experience, had I not come to the truth of creation, I can't imagine what else would have not only shaken me from my atheism, but also brought me to the truth of God's word. I'd heard the gospel, I grew up in the Bible Belt, but I could not reconcile that worldview with the one that I'd already implicitly accepted, which told me that the world is a meaningless accident. I had to first understand the very foundation or their supposedly scientific creation story is a lie, before I could come to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, I think the inherent cynicism of the heliocentric universe that exploded from nothing is fundamentally incompatible with the gospel of Jesus. Do you really think that our creator, who's so personal that he offered himself as a sacrifice so that we may be redeemed, matches up with some behind the scenes intelligent designer who had a veiled hand behind a big bang that created an ever-expanding universe where there's no such thing as up or down. I don't. I believe we are very carefully, intentionally, and lovingly placed in a world that is not just some random piece of a vast creation, but it's the very heart of creation itself. I believe that he is not in a heaven we vaguely imagine as somewhere else, but that he, his throne is just right above us. He is invested in us. That much the Bible makes clear. And so I pray that you reject the lie that would have you believe otherwise. Now, literally, in my book, Like Clay Under the Seal, I have one chapter dedicated to atheists come to Jesus, and it's testimony after testimony. And I, to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them all here. But you see, I could do this. I could do this for two hours on atheists that have come to Jesus because of understanding and seeing the evidence for a flat, stationary, geocentric, non-rotating flat Earth, as our government documents want to say. Um, I'm, I'm going to speed through this. I want to. I want to say this. These are reasons people that that 
people believe that we live on a spinning ball or sphere orbiting the sun in an ever-expanding universe. These are really the main reasons. The boats disappearing from the bottom up, we can say that doesn't happen. Pictures from space, we found out that that's a lot of fakery. Fisheye lens photography that creates a fake curve all the time. The alleged shadow of the Earth on the moon's surface during the lunar eclipse, that's easy to deal with. Foucault's pendulum, I mentioned that earlier. Erastinophanes, who probably didn't even exist, but his experiment works on a flat plane with a closed sun exactly, so there's no sense in that. Um, using that as an argument. Circumnavigation, you can go around your neighborhood or you can go around a sphere. You can do it either way and end up in the, back in the same place. Um, and satellites and GPS, I have a great deal about what those are from not only uh, declassified government documents, but just available documents. And of course, grandiose scientific explanations. Now, I'm just going to show you this. Of course, we've all seen this. If the boat went over a curve, there'd be no way to bring it back. But as you see when you zoom in, the boat's there. Now, if it's over a curve, you can't see it. Nothing would enable you to see that boat. But it, I don't care how powerful your zoom, but when you zoom in, it's the, the horizon's empty and you zoom in and the boat's there, they're not disappearing over a curve. They're just getting out of our ability to see it. So that is another misnomer. Here's the video I showed you about perspective. There's a guy walking away and you notice that his feet are disappearing. And then it goes up to his knees. And then up to his waist. He's walking on a flat football field now, but he's disappearing from the bottom of you know the Neil deGrasse Tyson, all these people say, oh, you want to know how it's curved? Go watch the boat go over the horizon. I mean, they still say this, and, they, and, and I can't believe that they don't know this. Right? I think they intentionally perceive it. So you see it coming back. That's just how our vision, how our eyes work. It's not a curved surface. And of course, here's... Uh, so you're telling me you can drag that ship back over the curve with that, that little telescope there. Now, I don't have time to go through. I'm going to just run through these very quickly, but we know that we've caught them photoshopping clouds and stuff. They create these images of Earth. They're not real pictures. Uh, even the guy who did the blue marble says it's photoshopped because it has to be. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, NASA artists do the pictures of the world. So this Oops. is just insane. And this is sort of how it... Here's, here's two pictures they tell us are from space of the Earth. I want you all to look at North America. Which one is correct? Because the one, the one there, the big one, seems like North America is taking up a big section of the ball there, much bigger than it really is. So we, we get these kind of things, and they want us to trust them, but it's just impossible. Um, here's where they faked the, uh, you know, the big picture we had for years was Apollo 17. And Apollo 17, they said, you know, they're at the moon 240,000 miles away. And they can see the whole Earth. But look, they only got a picture of that little circle there. The, they didn't get the whole lit side of the Earth. So it proves that they weren't high enough to get it, that they faked it. Um, Finally, the element that seals their fate. And this is where they faked it. I'm not even going to play it. You can go this, go watch a funny thing happen on the way to the moon, Bart Sabrell. He shows the picture footage. How many of you want to see it? Y'all want to see it real quick? All right, I'll back up and show you. Just so you know you can't trust them. Here we go. I'll play it. Finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be a...
Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, dear. We just wanted a narrative such that we can, when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a uh, the, uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with the TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. All right, I'm going to end that. You, you guys see, we can't, this is why we can't trust their pictures. Finally. But I'm going to go on. I want to go through all this. I could go through all the fakery. They were using fisheye lenses in, all the way in the 60s. I need to get to the Bible stuff. I can, I can give you this proof all day long right here, what things really Any are. High altitude balloons, that's what satellites are. We're going to go down through all of this stuff. I'm going to go. That, they, that's what they say is out there. You never see those satellites and debris out there, though, in the ISS flyover feeds. But here we go. Let's, let's get to this. Y'all see I had a lot of slides. There's long distance photography of Chicago, 60 miles. You shouldn't be able to see any of it. All right. I, I can't do it all.
I'm getting to the Bible because I know we're, we're out of time. All of this stuff's on my website, folks. The, seven, the sevenfold doctrine of creation series. This is our own test. I can show you. We, did, we saw Spool sitting on the dock at 11 miles away. That's my film right there at 11 miles away. S Spool sitting on the dock. Uh, this earth's not curved. I can tell you that right now. You can go with us and we can show you. See, let me zoom out. At 11 miles, there should be a seven-story building bulge blocking my view of what's sitting on the dock in the Alabama state docks there. Now, let's keep going. I've done shots. We've catch cars going across bridges at 13, 14 miles away. We know the height of them and everything. So we've done our own experiments. And we've had PhDs in physics. We've had engineers. We've had Army officers. Just to let you see, I'm going through them quick here. I'm going to get to the Bible stuff. I had 244 slides, y'all. Scientists proved that, that Kansas is flatter than a pancake all the way across. All right, let's go here. We're, we're to the Bible. Let me do this. All right, so we go back to the Genesis. Let's just, I'm going to go through the Bible as quickly as I can on this stuff. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form of void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I want you to notice something. He uses the term here, first of all, the waters. One thing we know about water, it always finds its level. We use levels to build buildings and to keep them level. And the term face is a term, it's a geometry term, it's a math term. And to use the term face of the earth and face of the waters is used multiple times, many times in the Bible. And what does a face mean? An individual flat surface of a solid object. But even if you want to argue that, I can tell you that you look at, you go out and you see like a pond or a lake and you see this perfect reflection upon it. That perfect reflection, that mirror reflection that you're seeing cannot happen on a curved surface, only on a flat one. Uh, let's keep going here. Here's the key, though. Here's, the, here's what, what most ministers and even so-called creation ministries get wrong is this issue is what is the firmament? What does the Bible teach about it? God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. I'm going to break this down as fast as I can for you. He talks about the open firmament of heaven, our atmosphere where the birds fly. The Bible teaches that the firmament that he's talking about here that he calls heaven is a solid crystalline structure that supports waters above it. That is called heaven. And then there is the third heaven where the throne of God is. All right? That's your three heavens, not some outer space, not some expanse. In fact, the most disingenuous and the most dishonest definition of this word is to call it some empty expanse. That is not how it's defined. That is not how Moses and Joshua and everyone believed what it was, even Josephus. I want to show you that. We've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. When we talk about what is the firmament, right? We know that God said here, Genesis uh, 1, 6 through 7, about the firmament divided the waters from the waters. The flood happened here, and it says that there were three things. In 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, that's one, and the windows of heaven were open, that's two. And God remembered Noah, and this was at the end of the flood, and all the cattle that was with him, and God made wind to pass over the earth, and the waters were assuaged. For the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain. So you had the fountains of the deep, the windows of heaven, which opened to let that water in that was from above, and then you also had rain. Anybody that says it was just rain is not being honest with the scriptures. It's that fact. We had three sources of water at the flood. What Christians believed for many years was a thing called the canopy theory. Dr. Carl Ball taught it and others taught it where they said that, that the firmament was a vapor canopy that was around the earth that condensed and then flooded the earth and thus doing away with the firmament. The problem with that is the Bible proves that wrong, that the firmament collapsed as a canopy because 1,350 years after the flood, the Holy Spirit moved on David to say, Praise him, ye heavens, and ye waters that be above the heaven. 
Let them praise his name, or praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. So anybody that says that the firmament or this was condensed vapor canopy that disappeared is not true. We have 1,350 years later, he's telling us the waters are still above the heavens. The Hebrew word for firmament is the Hebrew word rakia. It has a root word. Almost all Hebrew words have a three-letter root word. So you have rakia is the word for firmament, and the root word is raka. All right? Here's the definition of these words according to not only what the Hebrew meant, but also what they believed. So we have to see how God uses it. But firmament rakia does not mean an empty expanse. Anybody who tells you that the firmament or rakia means empty expanse, like, uh, like Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis, he will say it's an empty expanse, that the firmament is outer space. He is not being true to the definition of the Hebrew word. Literally, it says it is an expansion of plates, broad plates beaten out. So it's literally, the word means taking something that's solid and beating it into a shape. Okay? That's the definition of the word. Uh, the verb raka acquires the sense of beating out precious metals, spreading that out, and results to spread over or to overlay. All right? He goes on here. Of course, this is the Brown Driver Briggs. It says... Uh, extended surface, solid, expanse as beaten out. Not an empty expanse, but expanding something that's solid over something. That's the picture of this word. And the Hebrews, the ancient Israelites, believed that it was solid, the firmament was a solid structure, and called it the vault of heaven. So here's your definition, the vault of heaven or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid and supporting the waters above. This is what all of the ancient Jews believed because they believed the Bible. Amen? They believed it about the firmament. Here is another lexicon, Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, defines Rakia like this. The firmament of heaven spread out like a hemisphere above the earth, like a splendid, pellucid, translucently clear, transparent, crystalline, glassy, allowing the maximum passage of light as glass, sapphire, stone, to which the stars were supposed to be fixed and over which the Hebrews believed that there was a heavenly ocean. Now this is another lexicon, defining it as they believed it, as the Bible spells it out, not as new Copernican Christians want to believe it is to be. Now let's keep going. It says, additionally, Hebrew scholars believe, again, when they translated, you know, in 250 B.C., they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into, uh, from Hebrew to Greek. That was called the Septuagint version, around 250 B.C. When they translated the word firmament, they used the word stereoma, all right? And when they used the word stereoma, that is known word, Thayer's Greek lexicon defines stereoma, that which has been made firm, the firmament, the arch of the sky, which in early times was thought to be solid, a fortified place. Do you hear that? So the word they translated. So you're going to tell me Hebrew scholars translating the Bible from Hebrew and the Greek scholars translating it to make it. They just decided, no, we, we should pick a, a thin vapor or some kind of gas. No, they said something that's firm, that's solid. Again, this is what the scriptures teach. Now let's keep going because there's more. Here's the, uh, it says uh, uh, an ex strong extended surface, expanse beat. Now, just showing you that it's, it's multiple lexicons. Now, here's Job 37, 18. Now, this is going to show you, you know, this may not be technically God speaking, but this is one of, of the wise men of the East that were Job's friends. And this is what they believed. This is showing you what he believed. He said to Job, has thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? So what this proves, you can say, well, that wasn't God talking, but this is what they believed. And that, why did they believe it? Because they believed the Bible. They believed what God had already revealed to them. But let's keep going here. Is it that way? Now, the Hebrew word for spread out there is raka. Now, here's the definition of raka, and you need to, you, we're going to come back to this in a minute. The definition of raka means to pound the earth or as a sign of passion, to expand by hammering by implication to overlay with sheets of metal, to make broad, to spread abroad into place, to stamp. Oh, somebody say stamp. 
or like a seal pressed down. This is what a stamp is. He says this, that's what this word rock is. Now let's look at the, the ancient uh, Josephus, the historian. Now many believe that Josephus was also of a priestly line, that he was a priest and a Pharisee. So he was well acquainted with what the Jews believed about creation. And this is what he said about the firmament. He said, and this is in book one entitled The Constitution of the World and the Deposition, Disposition of the Elements. Josephus, the first, born in the first century but crossed over into the second century, he said, after this, on the second day, he, God, placed the heaven over the whole world, separated it from other parts, and he determined that it should stand by itself. So he's talking about the firmament here, that God placed it over the whole earth and that it stands by itself. In fact, in architecture, an arch is the strongest structure that you can build. And it also must be strong because it supports a lot of water. And he says here that he placed this firmament, the crystalline, notice he says crystal, crystalline firmament, round it and together in agreement and agreeable to the earth and fitted it for the giving of moisture and rain and for the affording advantages of dews. On the fourth day, he adorned the heaven with the sun, moon, and the stars and appointed them their courses. So this right here, Josephus is teaching a true biblical Hebrew cosmology because as God placed a firmament over the earth, he says the sun, moon, and stars are in that firmament and they all move in a circuit. So he's teaching the sun moves, the moon moves, the earth moves, not, I mean the, the stars, sun, and the moon, but not the earth. You understand? This is what the Jews taught and believed. All right? Now let's keep going. Does the Bible say more about this? And then basically God made a terrarium. This is the longest lasting terrarium in the world. You put the right things in a terrarium, guess what? Things flourish. They live forever. It's a beautiful structure that God made. Now let's go to this. We need confirmation. We'll go to the firmament. Is it crystal? What is it? So Ezekiel's talking about it in Ezekiel chapter 1. And he says, The likeness of the firmament upon their heads of the living creatures was as the color, the King James used a color, but the definition of that word is the appearance of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads, and when they stood and they had let down their wings, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness and appearance of a man above it. So Ezekiel in his vision, he is seeing this firmament over their heads and he said the appearance of it is like a terrible crystal and he says, and I see the throne of God sitting upon it and I see this, this, this image of a man upon it. So the Bible says God's throne sits upon this firmament that's solid and it's like a sea of glass. I wonder where that's in the Bible. He keep, we keep on, Revelation 4 says after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. He said, come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat upon the throne and he that sat upon the throne was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the side of an emerald and the throne and before the throne, there was a sea of crystal, a sea of glass like unto crystal. This is what the Bible said. That before the throne is like a sea of glass that's like crystal and God's throne is seated upon it. And it's interesting, he says, that there is an emerald rainbow or light emanating from that. And I wonder what that might be. But of course, the scientists say that's uh, electromagnetic radiation, that's radiation from the sun. Right, you know what I believe it is? The glory of God coming into the earth. <laughs> Shining through the crystalline dome that he sits upon. Revelation 15 also refers to the sea of glass at the throne of God. He says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, and for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Well, guess what? One of the ways you make glass is melting sand by, with fire. And he says, I, he says, now listen to this. He said, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God in their hands. Folks, Benny Hinn the other day said heaven was a 
was a planet, another planet out there. That is the biggest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard in my life. It's right above us. God's throne sits upon it, and he looks at us like grasshoppers through his firmament dome. This was uh, Amos 9, 6, of course, the, Hebrew, the, you know, the King James, I love my King James Bible, but sometimes they did not translate words, pick the right words correctly. I know some people, I think that they were perfect translators. They were not. This in the Amplified, you actually have to look up every word in the Hebrew in this verse to even understand what it's talking about. But listen to this. This is Amplified version of 9, 6. It is he, speaking of God, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has established his vaulted dome, the firmament of heaven, over the earth. He who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So here's another scripture that gives you an idea of the firmament. Now, here we are. The Bible teaches a circular flat earth, the North Pole, the magnetic center, the Antarctica, the ice walls. We've talked about that. The earth is stationary. Now, this is what the Bible says with a molten dome over it. Now, let's keep going through the scriptures. Now, any way you go from there south, we could talk about this all day long. They say there's not an ice wall, but there it is. Antarctica is the ice wall boundary around the oceans. I've got a whole sermon. It's like two hours long. I'm just Antarctica and the ends of the earth. There it is, Job 26.10. He's compassed the waters with bounds until night and day come to an end. He has inscribed a circular limit, right? It's not <laughs> on the face of the waters. I mean, you just keep going. He has fixed a circle on the surface of the waters and on and on. There's even declassified documents. It says most of the coast of Antarctica are covered by great depths of snow and ice extend seaward beyond the shoreline, terminate with vertical cliffs approaching 200 feet in height. So we want to say the wall's not there, but it is. Now, language is important. Language is important. A circle is not a ball. Okay? And God's word makes this very clear here that a circle is not a ball. In Isaiah 42, we're going to read that in a minute, it says it's he that sits upon the circle of the earth. There are people, Christians, that are still saying that that means the earth's a sphere. It never says sphere. The definition, this word is kug, and it means a circle. And it talks about in Proverbs, he inscribed a circle upon the face of the deep, not a sphere. In another place, in Isaiah 22, 18, he uses the term that King James translates ball. It is the word dur. So there's two different words in the Bible, Hebrew, the original Hebrew, for circle and ball, kug and dur. And God never uses dur, which means a sphere, to describe the earth. Never, never, never. All right? Here it is, you look it up, a circle, a circuit, a compass. This is the, the Strong's definitions. Circle, Proverbs 8, here's the word dur. Just show you, look it up, it says ball, pile, something that has shape to it, like that. All right, two different words for circle and ball, never used. Here it is, this is Proverbs. It says, when he established the heaven, wisdom, I wisdom was there when he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the fountains and springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set the sea its boundary so that the waters would not transgress the boundaries by his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So he's talking about God drew a circle. Let me tell you, I built my own fire pit back when I turned 50. I'm, I'm about to turn 56. I don't know if I can still do it, but I, I, you know what I did? I wanted a perfect circle because I wanted to build a four-foot diameter fire pit out of the, we have stones on our property. So what I did was I took a stake and drove it in the ground. I took a chain, ran it down the stake, and I took another one out here two feet, and I inscribed me a circle, and then I started building my outer wall. I just didn't put a firmament on it because I wanted to cook stuff in it. <laughs> Amen. Now, this is, again, what God describes. Let's keep going. Now, let's go back to that. When he says he's made the sky strong like a molten looking glass. Now, let's go back. Now, let's go to look at Isaiah 40, 21 and 22. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? 
It is he that sitteth upon the circle, kub, not dir, circle, not ball, of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So when he's talking about spreading out the heavens, he's talking about when he spread out the firmament over the earth. Notice he said, like a tent. Like a tent, not a ball. Do y'all see the difference? I ain't never been in a spherical tent in my life camping. And God said he made the earth like a tent. And here we are in a tent. Is the floor curved? No. God said, this, you want to know what the earth looks like? It's like a tent. Just like a tent. And the word for tent, of course, here's what an old tent like Abraham and Sarah would have been in. Flat ground spread out over them for a place to dwell in. The word for tent here in the Hebrew is ohel. And it means tent, right? But I'm going to show you something. Let's, let's go to, this is Psalm 19. Now Psalm 19, I'm, I couldn't start out with the beginning, but this talks about how the firmament shows the handiwork of the Lord. All right? So the context of this, he starts out talking about the firmament. And then he says this. He says, their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them, talking about in the world, our world he made for us, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Guess what the word tabernacle is here? It is the Hebrew word ohel, which means a tent, meaning that the sun is in the tent. Amen? Then he goes on to talk about the sun. He says, he set a tabernacle, a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from one end of the heaven of the firmament to the other, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The Bible word here for circuit, guess what it is? Kug. <laughs> it's a circle. A circuit means to move in a circular path. So what we believe and what we see, what the Bible teaches, what Joshua was saying it was happening was the sun was moving in its circular path. Now get this. This is, this is what will blow your mind. Notice it says that nothing will, t will, will escape the heat of our sun. Nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. Guess what? Look up nothing in the Hebrew and it means nothing. So let me ask you a question. If, if nothing that God made can escape, escape the heat of our sun, how are there galaxies millions and millions of light years away? The Bible says the sun is in the tent, inside the firmament, closer to us, smaller, moving in a circular path, and that nothing that God made for us escapes the heat of it. So y'all got to deal with that one right there big time. Here's another one. There it is, an example of it in the tent. Now, is there evidence to show that the sun is inside the tent, inside the firmament, closer to us, smaller? We have it every day. You, you, you're going to start watching. Some of you who are skeptics that don't believe this, you're going to walk outside one day and you're going to see this. You're going to see it with the sun. You're going to see it with the moon. But you're going to see the clouds behind the sun and the moon. You're going to see this. I have photographed this. If the sun is 93 million miles away, there's no way there should ever be a cloud behind it. Not ever. And notice that Job said there in 37.21, Now men see not the bright light or the sun that in the clouds which the wind passes away. He's trying to tell us where is the bright light he made. The great, the great light. Where is it? In here with the clouds. And sometimes we catch the clouds behind the sun. Even photographers who aren't trying to catch it. Look at that. And then somebody wants to say, oh, is this the sun so bright? It's just an illusion. And then somebody puts a negative filter on it and proves it right there. Clouds are in front and behind. I'll tell you something else about a sun 93 million miles away. Let me tell you, there's more. It doesn't make hot spots. If that sun is 93 million miles, this is a high altitude balloon that reached 110,000 feet. If that sun is 93 million miles away, how is there a hot spot directly under it? There should be even light across those clouds. 
This could happen over and over again. Look at the hot spot there above it. This is just a photographer who's not even a flat earther. The hot spot above the, the, the clouds right there. If that sun's 93 million miles away, the light rays should be coming in evenly, and there's no way there should be hot spots. You might get refraction. You might say, oh, the light rays are refracted, but wait a minute now. That's a hot spot, meaning that, that's close to it. It's just like anybody that knows lighting and theater knows that you got to deal with hot spots, meaning where the light's right on it, right? I could do this all day long, but there's evidence, and this is why atheists are, have come to Jesus because of this kind of evidence. The sun is not 93 million miles away. It's just not. Like these are pictures for people who are not flat earth, biblical cosmology believers. I could do it all day long. Look at that. It happens with the moon, too, regularly. In fact, this Reddit post, this is a person saying, I went out and saw the moon, and it looks like there's clouds behind it. There's no, how is that possible? And people were like, it's just an illusion. You're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. That's, their, that's an excuse they have. It's not, you're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. Look at there. Clouds in front and behind the moon. I have photographed this myself. Now let's move on to this. The Bible is very clear about this, you know, you want to believe we're on a spinning, flying water ball. Now, as you call yourself a Christian, you've got to deal with these verses right here. And this verse, we're going to start with a few of them here. But it's pretty clear, Zechariah 1.11, and here's what it says. And the, the, the angel that was talking with Zechariah answered and said, and, he said, and the angel answered, of the, and they answered the angel of the Lord, among the myrtle trees, says, we have walked to and fro through the earth. These are these entities that have gotten permission. And they said, behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Somebody say, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. How is it wobbling, spinning, flying, and in danger of asteroids hitting it? Some people say, oh, that's just talking about the people of the earth. No, he said, the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And guess what? I looked these words up in Hebrew. Guess what it means? Sit still. <laughs> at rest. Not moving. In fact, the word in the Hebrew, actually, yashob here, means to sit down, especially as a judge or sitting in ambush in quiet. All right? Now, this is what this is. So you're, if, if you're going to say, no, I believe the earth is spinning and it even wobbles as it spins and it's flying through an ever-expanding universe, then, then you just got to throw this out right here. But is that the only place God said it? No, it's not. So the earth is not moving. Here we go. First Chronicles 1630. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Now, now, literally, I heard Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis say, well, this just means like David when he said he, would, he wouldn't be moved. No, we're not talking about a man and his emotion or his religious beliefs and his stance. We're talking about the earth. He said the earth is stable. He said it can, that it be not moved. Psalm 93, 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he had girded himself. The world is established that it cannot be moved. Somebody say that. Cannot be moved. What did Satan come in? God said the world's still at rest. Said it cannot be moved. And Satan comes in with a theory says it's spinning, flying, wobbling, moving. Yet Einstein admitted that there's no experiment that can be done to prove that the earth is moving. But yet he said, I still believe it's moving. Right? So Einstein knew you couldn't prove that the earth was moving. Now here's Psalm 104, 1 through 5. He says, blessed and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. You are the one who covers yourself with light as with a garment who stretches out the heavens like a tent curtain. Here it is again. Multiple scriptures. The Bible says, let, by, every, let, by two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So here it is again. The world he stretched out like a tent to dwell in, who lays his beams in the upper chambers in the waters above the firmament, 
That's actually exactly what the Amplified says. Who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks in the wings of the wind, who makes the winds his messenger, flames of fire his ministers. Those are angels, so those are literal things. He said he established the earth on its foundation so that it will not be moved forever and ever. So see, I'm an earth is still guy. You then you got the earth is moving guy over here. It's pretty plain. Then it takes us to Job 38. So if you think we take verses out of context, Job 38, you can't, when, you, when you're talking about creation, God himself speaks to Job and the context of that conversation is the nature of God's creation. God himself speaking to Job. He said, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, and I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where were you? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof are fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone? So the context of this verse is clear this passage is about creation and God says he has foundations to the earth now if you believe the spinning ball heliocentric nonsense you believe that we have an iron molten core that is that is hotter than the Sun like 13,000 degrees with liquid magma around it and now they say there's even water around down in there somewhere does any of that sound like a foundation or stable or solid no no in fact they say that this, here here's their example they say we have a lead nickel core have you ever checked the the melting point of lead nickel it's way lower than 13,000 degrees but of course they'll say well it's because of pressure it's always their little excuse to get out of something but it's it's crazy God said he laid foundations of the earth let's keep reading he literally said to sink them down just like you would. I used to be in construction. We used to have to dig deep foundations. And they were poured very specifically. So he talks about it. Now I need to speed on through here. You see it right there, to the sink, press. Oh, like a seal too. He talks about the foundations. Now here's 1 Samuel 2, 8. And it says, he raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill and set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Does that, does that, does the heliocentric Copernican model sound like he's setting something on pillars, on a foundation that's stable, not moving, still in at rest? I, I, I don't know yet. Know it. See, this is what happened to me. You talk about what happened in the beginning. I just started believing this. I didn't filter it anymore through the world's nonsense. Now we see the world is still in at rest and I mentioned a minute ago about the Michelson-Morley experiment. It says Michelson-Morley found the earth wasn't moving by using the speed of two light beams against one another. The null result was one of the greatest puzzles of physics at the end of the 19th century. He says the possibility was that there would be the velocity would be zero and no fringe shift would be ex expected. But this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. So number one, they discovered that the Earth is really the center, the preferred object of the whole creation. And then he says that it was not what moving. And of course it was, they did find one sixth movement of Again, only one-sixth of what, it, what they said it was supposed to be moving, the speed it's supposed to be moving, they found one-sixth. Well, that's the movement, again, of the ether current, and I can't get into that. But here we go. Let's go. Let's get some. This, this, here's one of these documents. Now, I'm going to read. This is, this is one of these documents I dug up. This is, uh, let's see which one this is. Oh, there it is. The general equations of motion for a damaged asymmetric aircraft. Now, what's interesting, this is point one and point two. I, I, this is one of my favorites because here in introduction one, it says, in order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must reflect the underlying physics. Somebody say, must reflect the underlying physics. So if they're going to study damaged aircraft and how, it, how it, things happen to it in the sky, it says that the dynamic equations of motion must 
properly reflect the underlying physics. In the next part, he says, this is just part two, that was in part one, he says, in this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating earth are developed. Now, if in point one you say that studying this must reflect the true, proper, underlying physics, and the next thing you say all of our equations of motion are based on a flat, non-rotating earth, how else can you, how else can you read that? And if there's not a flat, non-rotating earth, why would it be in here? Why would this unicorn be here? I'm talking about the fairy tale unicorns. Unicorns were real, by the way, but not the fairy tale unicorn. Y'all see that? Let's read it again. In order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. In this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating earth are developed. So here we have the Bible saying that the earth does not move, it's stable, it's at rest. We have the Michelson-Morley experiment proving the earth does not move that, that just blew up physics in the end of the 19th, uh, early 19th century there. And then, I mean the late 19th century, and then we have a government document about how damaged aircraft work and they admit that the, the, uh, the proper underlying physics and equations are based on a non-rotating flutter. That's three witnesses, y'all. Y'all hear me? That's the Bible, true scientist, and a technical manual about aircraft. Three witnesses. Now, I know some people love to pull this one out, so I'm going to deal with this. Oh, about the earth hanging on nothing. What is that talking about? Right? Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. Right? Here's what it is. King James Version says, Hail is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. This is Job 26, 6 and 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, the, the, the Copernicans, the, the ones that want to have this space, say, oh, see, 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 that's, that's space. That's, we're hanging on nothing. No, 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 my friend. You must dig a little deeper because the Hebrew words bear out what this means. And again, we have to take context. You can't take verse 7. You've got to take verse 6. So he's talking about hell or Sheol or the underworld, the underground. What do we know is in hell? We know there's, there's, there's different degrees of hell. And I'm not talking about Dante's degree, I'm talking about Bible degrees. But we, we know that we have different words and there's Tartarus for the deepest part of hell. And, and then we know that Satan is going to be bound when Jesus returns. Satan's going to be bound and placed in the, somebody say, bottomless pit. Which is in hell, which is the lowest part of hell. Okay? Now, what this here is saying, and let's go to the Amplified, does it really well. But the Amplified Bible, and looking at the original Hebrew word, here when it says he stretches out the north over the empty place where he hangs the earth upon nothing. When it says the word for upon clarifies this question about the earth allegedly hanging upon nothing. An empty place is the word tohu. Now tohu in Hebrew, tohu vabohu was used in the creation when it says the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the deep. Well, if you look this word up, it means a desolation, destruction, chaos. And I, I can't get into all that right there. But he says... That it's pronounced tohu, right, is chaos, wilderness, waste, confusion, a place of vanity or emptiness. The Hebrew word here upon is all, which can be translated above or over. And so in the Amplified, it says, Sheol, the place of the dead, is naked before God, and Abaddon, the place of destruction, has no covering for his eyes. It is he who spreads out the northern skies over the emptiness and hangs the earth over nothing. See, there is, this is what we believe. Nobody knows how deep the earth is. God said the heaven for height and the earth for depth, nobody would know. It's unsearchable, unknowable. The deepest hole ever dug is about eight miles. The Russians did it. We don't know anything beyond that. But at some point down there in hell, there is nothingness. There's a place of vanity and emptiness. There's a bottomless pit where Satan's going to be chained for a thousand years. And God stretched it out. And if you guys saw my Mountain of God in the North and Paradise series, some of you, if you had not seen that, you need to watch it. You understand that God's throne is right above the North Star. The North Pole 
It's right there. And where we're taught, the Bible shows us that it's really underneath. Underneath there is where paradise and hell starts, right there. So it makes sense. This verse makes sense when you know the truth of the shape of the earth and the nature of things. But taking this into context, it's not talking about hanging the earth in some empty space. It's talking about hanging the earth. Oh, the earth is just over this place of nothingness. So we deal with that. Now we get to Joshua. I'm just going to say, what did he say? Sun stand still upon Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed and the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun, here's the Bible says, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. That means it was, it was moving, not the earth. So Joshua here is teaching a completely different cosmology than the world and many of you have accepted. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And here's what's interesting. He said the sun was over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. Do you know what that means? The sun and the moon were over specific places that were pretty close to each other. It's amazing exactly east and west of each other. Look at here. There's Gibeon. There comes our moving sun. And there's our moon down over here in the valley of Ajalon. He could see them both. And what's interesting is that happens to us every now and then. In their circuits, they catch up with each other once in a while. And that's why you'll see the sun over here sometime in the sky and the moon right there by it. But Joshua knew exactly what areas of the earth they were over. And that's what the Bible says. Can we keep going? I can prove. Here we go. Let's, get, let's, let's go on. I got more illustrations. I'm going through them. The sun doesn't go down. We talked about that. It says to go or come. Now, there's Gibeon. There it is again. Goodness, I must have doubled up some slides here, right? Here we go. We're getting through them. Of course, these crepuscular rays, these type of rays coming down shows the sun is not far away. I can't even get into that right now. All right. I've covered this. The Bible says the sun moves in a circuit to the ends of the earth. There's nothing hid from the heat thereof. There's your circuit means course or path. Here's the Hebrew word for circuit there. A revolution. That is the sun's course circuit. Here's another thing that's impossible in their model. And I'm trying to go quick, y'all, but it's, it's, it's a lot. The sun, he says here, Ecclesiastes, the sun arises, and that word arise just simply means it's not elevation. It means the rays begin to shoot forth when it, when it comes close to us. And then he says the sun goeth down. Again, that's the word bow. That just means to come and go. It doesn't mean to go up and down. And he says that the sun, though, hastes to his place where he arose. I mean, he goes back to the same place. How is that possible in a heliocentric universe? How can the sun, they say the sun's moving through this universe, just it ever expanding. How can it ever return to the place it was before? Doesn't do it. Either the Bible's true or your, your, your secular heliocentric Copernican cosmology is true. They can't both be true. Here's an interesting document I found from one of Russia's top scientists that we stole from them during the Cold War. A. A. Orlov, his family was a highly awarded, decorated scientist in Russia. And we stole this from him, and this is in declassified now. And he's talking about lunar solar disturbances in motion of artificial Earth satellites. And he says this here it is assumed that the sun moves along a circle near the center of a planet satellite system of the masses. He says, an analysis is made of the motion of the satellites ca characterize any eccentricity, he says, an inclination of its orbit relation to the plane of the sun's motion. He says the sun's motion. He says the, he says the sun is moving in a circle. This is a Russian scientist in a top secret document. It says the sun is moving, has motion, and it moves in a circle. Isn't that amazing that God said in Psalm 19, the sun moves in a circle? Now, the shape of the earth. I know we're, hey, Pastor, you told me we could do it in six hours, so I'm trying. Yeah. 
I'm trying, but I have to get it all in, all right? Now, this is the shape of the earth. Now, of course, everybody knows my book is entitled Like Clay Under the Seal from this, this verse in Job 38, 14. Now, I know he's going to try to attack that, so I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to just destroy any possible attack on it. Because, number one, the context of Job 38 is creation. Many Bible scholars, translators have translated that this is talking about the earth being or taking shape like clay under the seal. But I'm going to give you some other witnesses from Scripture that this is exactly how God made the earth or shaped the earth. But here's a few verses. We'll look at them. Here's the King James. It says, it is turned, talking about the earth, is turned. It's not talking about spinning because he said it means change. That, that Hebrew word means change like he would change a potato into mashed potatoes, right? Or like a person who was clean, the word is used when they got leprosy, it says they, their skin changed, okay? So it's not saying spinning. He says it's turned or changed as clay to the seal or the signet ring. And so clay was a glump of clay or seal, and they would press it down with a signet ring, all right? So that gives you a flat surface with upturned edges there. Um, the complete Jewish Bible. Anybody think the Jews know how to translate their own Hebrew scriptures? I would think the Hebrews would know that no Hebrew would get us the Hebrew correct, okay? So here's the complete Jewish Bible. It says, then the earth is changed like clay under the seal. So they even got it in there. And then, of course, the Amplified Bible says, the earth is changed like clay into which the seal is pressed. The NIV says the earth is take shape like clay under the seal. So there you have all these several different translations and you have the, the definition of the words which I could go into. Now here's the verses that confirm this because the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. Amen? So this idea of the earth taking shape like clay under a signet ring or seal being pressed down flat this image is also what we get in other verses about creation, but you have to look up the Hebrew words. I'm going to give it to you here. So Isaiah 42.5 says this, Thus saith God, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, that created the heavens and stretched them out. Notice it says, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. When he says he that spread it out, just remember that. He spread forth the earth. Another scripture, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the wound. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth. Again, he says that term. Now, notice it says by myself. I'm going to show you a mistake that King James makes here. He says, who stretches out the earth by himself. Do you know I can read a little Hebrew? And you know what? And I've got my Hebrew scholar here, one of them, our Dr. John Strazich, to get it right there, PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. He'll tell you this too. This right here, when it says he spreadeth abroad the earth in Isaiah 44, by myself, is not in the original. It's et ma'im in Hebrew. Et ma'im means upon or in relation to the waters. Ma'im is the waters of creation. So he's saying that he spread the earth in relation to the waters, just like he says in Genesis 1. Let's keep going. He says, and then there's Psalm 136.6. It says, to him that stretches out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. So let's look at this term, spreadeth out. Because three times here, he says he spreads out the earth, meaning telling you this is how I did it. Like if a woman's rolling out some dough, she says, I spread out the dough. But how does she do it, Right? He's going to tell you how he did it. Right here is the word. It's that word again, raka, where we get the word rakia from. But the word raka, the verb, where he spread out the earth, this is what it means. Look at this. Brown driver, Briggs lexicon, also the strongs. Beat. Somebody say stamp. Yeah. Spread out. Spread out. Press down. Y'all see it? Stamp. Stamp is just another term for, guess what? A seal. But he uses the term stamped, pressed down. So literally you could read those verses. If you back up to those verses, that he stamped forth the earth, that he pressed it down. 
This is the same picture. So three times you have this. There it is. To beat, to stamp, to beat out, to spread out. Guess what? You can buy these. They're called stamp kits. You see it? Go ahead and put it back up there. Stamp. What's the definition of stamp? Bring down one's foot upon heavily on the ground or on something on the ground. He stamped his foot in frustration. Impress a pattern or mark. Wax stamp kit. There it is right there. That's what the word stamp means. So we have those verses. Now I'm going to end, I'll, I, well, hopefully we'll end on this. But here, here's, if you want confirmation from the New Testament. I was getting prepared to do a, mar- a message on the marriage supper of the Lamb. I wasn't even studying creation or cosmology. And I was reading this, and I've read it many times out of the King James Version. It says, when the thousand years were expired, this is Revelation 27 through 9, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and she'll go, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God from heaven and devoured them. So this is talking about the last rebellion after the 1,000-year millennial reign. Now notice he uses the term the breadth of the earth here. Now, now it's what hit me. The Holy Spirit hit me. And I'm reading this, and I'm like, he could have just said that they came out upon the earth. No need to put the breadth of the earth there, Right? It's actually like an added word. I'm like, why is that even there? And I'd never looked it up. In all my 36 years of studying the Bible, I never looked it up. So I looked it up. Start looking up these Hebrew and Greek words, it gets dangerous. Because the word breadth here is the word plateaus. Sound familiar? Plateaus. What are plateaus? They're a flat land, right? Well, the word, the root. And notice in in your Greek dictionary, it's going to lead you down the root words. And it says... The word here is plateaus, which means width or breadth. Plateaus, we know what it means. He says it's from, though, 4116 in your Greek dictionary. So let's go to 4116, which is the, well, the root word plateaus. Plateaus. What does plateaus mean in the Strong's Greek dictionary? To spread out flat. So literally the verse in Revelation 20 says they went up upon the flat earth. That's the definition of the words in the original language. Here's where it gets even crazy. Notice it says that that plateaus has a root word. Plateaus says it comes from 4111. Right? So let's go to 4111 and see what it says. Here's the, de- the, the word 411. Here's the word in Greek. Listen to what it means here. Plasso, to form, mold something from clay or wax. <laughs> Literally, the potter fabricates or shapes something from clay or wax that's flat. That's that word, the breadth of the earth. This is why you have to study the Bible deeper than many of us have over the years. We lose so much understanding when we don't go back to the original Hebrew and Greek and even sometimes to the verb tenses of the the Greek language. And there they're all three together. And I'm going to just end with this part. I'm not going to show you, but there have been two astronauts that were interviewed. One, the general, highly decorated Mishlaw Hermaneski, who recently died. He was the only Polish cosmonaut for the Soviet Union. He was asked in an interview right here, you've been there, is the Earth really a sphere, a sphere hanging in outer space? And his answer was, the Earth is flat, as some may expect. I didn't expect this question I assure you it's flat. And there was another Russian cosmonaut who was awarded to be the hero of the Soviet Union. He said, we haven't been to space. If someone claims that we have been, it's not true. It's not the truth. 
These are two astronauts. I believe in the days ahead, these are whistleblowers. I believe in the days ahead, we're going to have more whistleblowers that come out and tell the truth. Well, folks, I have given you the witness of Scripture, the witness of scientists, astronauts, but even those don't matter. The Word of God is clear. God made the earth still and it rests immovable, stable upon pillars, upon a foundation. And in God's creation, there is an up and a down. Jesus ascended up. Where is that? Where is up for the poor Australians? Heaven is up. Hell is down. That is a simple concept. Doesn't work on a spinning water ball. All right? But God said he made the earth with a firmament over it, and it's a solid, crystalline, molten glass dome. And his throne sits upon it. And he says over and over, the earth is shaped like clay under a seal. It's the breadth of the earth, the flat earth. It's motionless. This is what God describes in the scriptures, and this is why many atheists have got saved when they've seen the evidence so I rest my case. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Dean. Thank you. That's good. Give him a hand. Not everybody wants to debate these issues, and so that's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. And so thank you so much for your thoroughness. Sorry we don't really have six hours apiece. We could talk about this for 20 hours apiece, okay? You're not going to get the whole, the whole ball of wax, right? You're just, you're just not. You're not going to get all of it at one time. There's a lot there, and so I recognize the fact that we, we feel like at least that we're, we're feeding you with a fire hose and just trying to give you so much information. And I know we had to skip through a lot. So once again, give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir, for your honesty. I appreciate that. And, and it's, it's good to have a little, our honesty back and forth, even our, our snarkiness, you know, we, we, we get a little, get a little uh, fired up about things. That's all right, that's part of it. And so I wanna go into the word of the Lord and uh, give you the perspective from my vantage point theologically. Now, uh, I'm not a real big high-tech redneck PowerPoint guy, and so some of the verses will come up just when I call the guys in the back, they can throw them up. I'm just, gonna, I'm just a Bible guy, right? So I'm gonna do some flipping, and uh, this is a Bible debate, so I suppose that at least a few of you have your Bible tonight, and so uh, I, I don't have to take as long as he did, only because he, he has a lot of information that I don't have, right? A lot of information that I uh, am not privy to, uh, as it were, and so he, he had a lot to say, and so I just, I want to kind of keep the perspective so uh, we can kind of go back and forth if there's time for that, Lord willing, in a few moments. But let me just start right off the rib with the word of the Lord and then just kind of go down through some very important aspects of what I believe the Bible teaches. Psalm 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. And the Bible says, because he's ordained strength, he says unto the people that he steals, he he stops the avenger. He stops those that come against him. And then he makes a very interesting declaration in Psalm chapter 8. He begins to talk about the fact that because God made everything the way that he did, because the world has been absolutely made by God, I read just today, as a matter of fact, this right here. He says, when I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained. He said the finger work, the finger painting, like a little kindergartner, the finger painting of God is indeed the heavens, the firmament, the, the moon, he says, and the stars. It took nothing for God to make that. But then he asked this question, what is man that thou art even mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? So here's the two different directions that we're going. I get enclosed dome, all of that. We'll talk about that. But listen, my idea is not just talking about the expanse because firmament clearly means heaven. It's what the Bible says. I don't believe it means expanse. It means heaven. It's what the Bible says. But I so believe in the expansiveness of God that David looked up and he saw all the things that the Lord had created. He saw all the unbelievable things in creation and said, holy smoke. 
folks, who am I? What is man that you are even mindful of me? Why would you even think about me amongst so many unbelievable things that you have created? The vastness, the expansiveness, the more and more. You see, I don't believe that the universe expanding, Genesis 2, 1, God made it all at one time. I believe our understanding of the universe is expanding. And those are two very different ideas, you understand. And so we have to recognize the fact that, yes, we believe that we are the cream de la creme of God's creation okay he didn't die for birds he didn't die for rocks he didn't die for planets he didn't die for atmospheric conditions Jesus died for the sins of the world so yes I understand that we are the center of creation I understand that we are the darling apple of God's eye but even in the Bible the man created by God said, holy smokes, creation is so much bigger than me. Why would you even think about me? So this, to be honest, is not about creation. We don't disagree on creation. I don't believe in a big bang theory. I don't believe in millions of years. I believe in six literal days of creation. I don't believe in any of that. I don't believe that we're from monkeys. I don't believe any of that stuff, okay? All of that's nonsense. We know that that is evil. We know that that is wrong. That is science falsely so-called. That is Romans chapter 1 suppressing the truth. And the man of God said that. I get all of that. And so really, at the end of the day, that there was a lot of talk about creation, but not really a lot of talk about yay or nay about flat earth. We, we believe in creation. Just because I believe in a model that is different than yours, which I believe, as I'll show in a moment, is biblical, does not mean that I'm an evolutionist. I don't believe in evolution. I, I don't believe that, that science is greater than the Bible because the Bible's not a science book, but it's scientifically accurate, you understand? It's not a math book, but it's mathematically accurate. And so, to begin the debate with really what I would consider a straw man argument of it's about creation. Yeah, of course it's about creation. We don't disagree on creation. We don't even disagree on the way that God did creation. We know in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. Nobody in this room, unless you're lost, would deny the reality of that biblical fact. And so we're really not fighting creation. We're fighting, let me just use the word, cosmology, right? We're fighting the shape of the earth, okay? So I'm going to get to the Bible. But it's interesting because so many times people say, well, this is what all of the early believers believe. No, it's not. It's what some ancient Hebrews believe. Absolutely it is. And they like to use that little picture from Logo Software. Look, Logo Software is promoting, you know, this particular idea. I called Logo Software and I said, look, i got to ask you guys a question. They sent me actually a statement back, an email statement that I have in my phone right now. And they say, we absolutely do not believe in, what they say, anti-science when it comes to the flat earth theory. We just have to put things in there based off of what people actually did believe at one time until they began to understand through observation, through experimentation, and through what you guys would say, what you can clearly see, experience, and feel. And so it's not that some people did not have that cosmology, but please know this, because here's where flat earthers sometimes on YouTube uh, want to want to change the game a little bit. They tell you that it was the cosmology. No, no, it was a cosmology, because a lot of people believe that the earth was on the back of a turtle or it was square, or it was triangle, or it was, and some people still believe this to this day, an infinite plane over and over and over. Some people, and I'm not saying the people in here so you ain't got to boo me, but some people have the fantastical notion that if you could somehow get to what they refer to as the edges of the earth, when you go through one side like Pac-Man, you come back in the opposite side. Now we've gone into science fiction realm. Okay, now we've gone far beyond the reality of the Bible. And then they're like, well, you know, that's just how things operate in space. Well, you don't believe in space, so you don't get that argument, you understand, right? And so the Bible is extraordinarily clear, I believe. And so, let, let me say this. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, you know what the Bible says? We are all men made of one blood for to dwell on all the face of the earth. The times are appointed, and here's what God says. And he hath given us the bounds of our habitation. That's why I don't believe in aliens. We agree with that, right? 
I don't believe in E.T. and little green men. I do believe that is going to be a last day's deception that they are going to say, oh, look what the aliens can. Ain't no aliens. You believe in that nonsense, you need to quit smoking meth. Okay, you don't believe, there's no such thing as that. But I want you to understand that at the end of the day, right here according to the Bible, he bound our habitation. My question is, why does he have to specifically tell us that our habitation to earth has been bound? Because the other planets... Yes, I believe in them that he created are not habitable. They were just built because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, the firmament, the heaven showeth his handiwork. And the handiwork, according to what the Bible just said in Psalm chapter number eight, that David was so mesmerized by the handiwork was the moon and the stars and all that God created. We have been bound to inhabit only the earth. And so from that vantage point, that makes us the center of God's creation. But the earth itself is not the center of a orbital galaxy. It's just not. There's no way around that fact. I know I won't get nearly as much applause. And the reason our people aren't going to applaud because they're just trying to figure out what I'm going to say because they've never heard some of this stuff. So they're just trying to hold on for dear life and buckle in and hope I don't break a microphone tonight, right? And so they, they can be as quiet as they want to. You see, I don't have to have claps. I don't have to have validation. I got 66 books right here that will validate everything that's about to come out of my mouth. 1189 chapters, right? 791,328 words. Okay, the, the Bible is going to tell us everything we need to know. Now, I, I'm about to pull something out here, and you're going to have to start flipping around with me and help me out here. But I want to go further and prove that about we're the only one that's inhabited, but we're certainly not the only one. You know what Hebrews 11 says? It's a faith chapter. And Hebrews 11 and verse 3 says, By faith we know that the worlds, plural, were framed by the Word of God. He does not say, by faith we know that the world... He said, by faith, we know that the worlds, multiple, were framed by the Word of God. And the reason that's important is because Acts 17, as we just said, because there are multiple planets, there is only one that is inhabited because there is only one that Jesus was sent to to die for the sins of the people that inhabit that earth. So... There was a time I thought, well, you know, maybe this is not a gospel issue. And I don't want to make it a gospel issue. But when you say things open-ended like, if you're a Christian, then you're going to have to believe the way that we're... That, that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Because you can believe flat, square, spherical, and go to hell with a broke back. This ain't about the shape of the earth. Okay, this is not a salvation issue at all. And I'll go one step further. I'm going to get to the word, praise God. i got time. I am excited about atheists that have... Listen, if you think I'm going to sit there and be like, I'm not going to applaud. Man, I'm happy when anybody gets born again. Paul said if, if Christ be preaching contention, he's going to be excited about it. Amen? So I'm excited when people get saved. But let me tell you something very interesting. You've got to be careful about that because what it sounds like is flat earth saved me. No, the gospel saved you. Flat earth may have been a highway that got you there, right? And that's okay. Creation may be something that got you there, but it didn't save you. Globe earth didn't save you. Jesus saved you. you. You didn't put down a bottle because of the shape of the earth. You put down a bottle because the shape of your heart got changed when Jesus invaded your space. Now, I'm supposed to be debating, not preaching, but listen. I mean, just, just, just think about that. From, so I'm not against the people that have been saved. I'm glad for it. But, but I want you to think about something. I wrote this down for later rebuttal, but we roll it. Listen, this is not, by the way, a loaded question, okay? This, this is not a loaded question. It's important. I, I just want to ask, pa Pastor Dean, just from your vantage point, and here's why I'm asking you this, okay? So this is not a trick question. Uh, because I think we agree on this. Do you, do you believe or do you teach like a secret rapture? Because I don't. Okay. Okay, great. So, so we agree on that. There was a time that I was all, you know, woo, do you jumping jacks? Okay, right. I get it. And, and, and listen, the rapture is not a salvation issue. Okay? So there was a time that, that I really did. You know, I preach rapture, rapture, rapture. So here's why I bring that up. Both he and myself do not teach a secret rapture. 
But neither one of us would discount the number of converts that had been reached because of things like Left Behind, movies and books, and teaching about a secret rapture. So neither one of us teach it, but neither one of us would get up here and say, well, you can't really be born again because you came around in, you know, in, a, uh, in a false theological system. No, they can get born again. So it's interesting that you can use a wrong model but get right results because the results are based on the gospel, not on the model you understand. Does that make sense? I, I hope it does. You know, Moses got water out of the rock both times. But one time was right and one time was wrong. Right? And so understand that I'm not against the fact that people get saved. I'm glad people get back in church because of, of conspiracy theories that led them to flat earth. I am great with that. I'm not against that. Okay? There are people in this room, for example, that are glaringly a thousand percent different from me. But if we weren't necessarily having this conversation, I think we'd get along. I think me and Flat Earth Day could go to coffee and really kind of be friends. But if you put us on a YouTube channel, I'm telling you, woo, the earth would spin. I'm telling you, it's just the facts, okay? It's just the facts. And so I, I'm not trying to be a jerk for Jesus. I'm just trying to tell you the Bible's pretty plain, and the only way a person really comes to faith is through Jesus, not through heliocentrism, geocentrism, and all these big fancy words that most people have no idea what they mean, okay? I'm just a hillbilly. I like to use simple King James English. All right, now. I'm not going to, uh, guys, I want you to put up the, the passage. If they can hear me in the back, if not, I'll turn to it. Uh, he said I was going to attack his, uh, his passage in his book. I'm not going to attack it. I'm just going to correct it, all right? So uh, Job 38 is where I want the guys to go, if they can hear me back there. If not, I'll just read it. Uh, Job 38, need you to go there. This is important. Job chapter number 38, verse 12 through 14, all right? Job 38, 12 through 14. Now, I did read the book, not all of it, not verbatim, not word for word. I did like chapter 6 because it had a lot to talk about the testimonials of people uh, that are being saved and have been saved. Now, let me read through this, right? Here is the, the clay under the seal analogy that he uses. I don't attack that because I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm not real interested in the whole smash down in the whole stamp down, in the whole upturned sides. And I'm not interested in it from this passage because this is not at all what that passage has anything to do with. Okay? I, I just, I want to show you. Now, I know it's on the screens there, but sometimes I like to, to turn to certain places in the Bible. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? Now, again, he was correct. Okay? Job is being rebuked. By the Lord, harshly, things are happening in this context. God's asking him 84 questions that are basically unanswerable. And so he says, look, have you commanded the morning since thy days? No, you haven't commanded the morning, okay, because we don't get to do that. But watch this. And cause the day spring to know his place. Well, what's the day spring? Well, the day spring is just a King James word for the sunrise. And we know later in the context that Jesus uh, is called the day spring, right? And so understand, he's, just, he's simply talking about an analogy of the sun right here. He says, plainly, is this not the day spring? Don't, don't, uh, hey guys, don't move them things back there because I didn't know my Bible until I go to the next one. Thank you. And so you cause the day spring, the sunrise, to know his place. It's obvious he's talking about the sunrise. Now watch this. That, it. Everybody see that word, it? Oh, you're going to get quiet now that I brought the Bible out. What's the word, it, referring to? The subject, which is the day spring. Which is the sunrise. Y'all quit changing in passages back there. Go back to verse number 12 again. Hast thou commanded the morning since the days and caused the day spring to know its place? That it, the day spring, the sunrise, might take hold of the ends of the earth. We'll get to that passage. That the wicked might be shaken out of it. Next verse. He's still talking about the sunrise. He's saying that nothing, as the man of God said, is going to escape the heat of the sun. The sun's going to rise. No wicked person can hide. Okay, it doesn't matter. Men love darkness rather than light, but the sun's going to rise. It's going to shine light. That's what the Bible says. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth. That the wicked might be shaken out of it. Watch this. It is turned, and he's correct in his analogy to say that the word does not mean turn like this. He's not talking about orbiting, he's talking about change. It is changed as clay to the seal. Now listen, 
We can use a thousand analogies about rings being pressed into wax. Here's exactly 1,000%, no way around it, no way around it. He can even come back up and explain himself about it if he wants to, right? But I got a long way to go. He says, just as wax has no form whatsoever, okay, and we don't even talk in this terminology. This is old English. Just as wax has no form, it's just wax. It's just hot wax. He says, just like when a signet, signet ring, roll, I don't care what it is, okay? Just like when it is dipped in the wax, what happens? The wax gets into the cracks of the signet, and the signet comes to life before your very eyes. When the sun rises, it takes the darkness of the face of an earth that has no contour and no shape but as the sun rises the darkness of the crevices and the cracks of the earth began to show themselves and when the sun rises it sheds light on an earth that you could not see its contours and curvature or whatever you want to call it before that and so just as the sun brings reality to what we could not see so when a ring is dapped, dipped into the wax all of a sudden the wax fills up the crack there's only one thing he is talking about and it is the revelation that sunlight brings when the sun rises in the morning now wait a minute is there anybody in the room that would say huh, that's theological gymnastics because it's not talking about the day spring is it talking about the sunrise, yes or no? It, it's only talking about the sunrise. And as the sun rises, it sheds light on things we could not see just as wax has no form. Until you dip something in it that has form and it conforms to it and now you can clearly see it. And by the way, that happened in the very first chapter of the Bible because when darkness was upon the face of the deep, God said, let there be light. And guess what? The light shed abroad the contour of what God was creating. This verse is not about cosmology. I'm sorry. Now, it may be a cute verse to use and talk about the upside, the upturned sides. That, that's great. That's fine. I don't mind if you use it. Here's my beef with it. You can believe the earth is any shape you want to. And we can have coffee. Just not Starbucks. <laughs> my gripe is not with people that believe flat earth. My gripe is with people that say the Bible teaches it. That's a totally different concept. Now look, it ain't kill the ogre time. Chill out. Chill out. I'm five verses in. Got a lot way to go. I'm, I'm going slow on purpose. Because look, you, you cannot take that verse to mean anything other than what it means. It's a sunrise verse. That's it. It is a sunrise verse. That is it. Okay, anyhow, uh, let's get to some Bible. And uh, as if we've not already dealt with some. When I talk about the Bible, let me say something. I'm not talking about the book of Enoch. Stop that nonsense. Stop it. You see, you like to quote the book of Enoch when it fits. But when you get later in the book of Enoch, when it doesn't fit, you skip those parts. And everybody's like, book of Enoch. Well, you know, the Bible quotes the book of Enoch. Yeah. And what part the Bible quotes? Guess what? The Apostle Paul also quoted lost historians and poets. It was historical framework. But if you're going to say, the Bible teaches... A flat earth then don't use a non-canonized book that's not in the Bible to do it am I making sense you don't get to say I believe the Bible the book of Enoch says I don't care what the book of Enoch says the book of Enoch was not even written by Enoch and don't say things like well you know David had it on his mind when he was writing the book of Enoch was at least a thousand years after David okay and so when I say I'm, I'm gonna talk about what the Bible says I don't care what NASA says did you know there is not one thing I believe about the earth that NASA taught me? I can't remember one single time. 
I saw one guy, he did a video. He's like, well, you know, I got a, I got a plastic globe here, and on the bottom of it, you know why we can't trust it? Because it says, not for educational purposes. Okay, right, cool. You ever seen the back of a condom box? It says it don't prevent sexually transmitted diseases or pregnancy. It's a disclaimer, folks. There's nothing I believe about the globe that, that I learned from NASA, right? And I love these huge leaps of faith. Well, he went from working from Disney to NASA. So it's all fake. That is, excuse the pun, circular reasoning. That's nonsense. I don't care what NASA says. There's never been a time in my life that I've ever... NASA, can, can I have... I don't care what NASA says. You know, Samuel Robotham was a long time before NASA. What was his excuse? He was a snake oil salesman that believed he had an elixir that if you drank it, you would live everlastingly. The guy had more atheism than he did Christianity, and his Christianity was sketchy at best. He's like in his middle 20s when he comes up with the Zetetic astronomy. Look, I would not trust my 21-year-old son to pastor an outhouse, much less build my entire theological framework by some cat that couldn't get a real job. And so what he decides to do is go to a channel, go to a creek that seemed to be flat for like three or four miles. And because it seemed to be flat, which was later disproven, by the way, which was seemed to be flat for just a few miles, now he's built this entire theological framework that the church has bought into hook, line, and sinker. And they say, we believe the Bible. We believe the Bible. And quote, no Bible. I don't care what NASA says. I don't care what your fifth grade teacher said. Those people are not the authority in my life. Okay, Disney is definitely not the perverted authority in my life. There's things we can agree on, but stop saying you believe the Bible and then discounting the Bible. So here's what happened right from the very get-go. He said, you can't get up and say that the Bible is just metaphors. Well, you can if it's a metaphor. If it's intended to be metaphorical, it's intended to be a metaphorical. You can only take the Bible literally where it's supposed to be taken literally. And many times figurative analogy leads to literal understanding, right, of a metaphorical, you know, translation. There are many metaphors in the Bible. I'm just going to very quickly explain that to you, right? Think about this one. In John chapter 3, Jesus came to a guy named Nicodemus and said, Ye must be born again. Well... Nicodemus had the same mindset as a lot of people in this tent because he was such a literalist he said oh does that mean I got to re-enter my mother's womb and be born and Jesus said no that which is born of flesh is flesh but that which is born of spirit is spirit marvel not that I said unto thee ye must be born again that's the biggest metaphor in the whole Bible and nobody in this room would have trouble with that everybody sees that it was a metaphorical reference that led to a literal salvation in this man's life. But it was a metaphor. Ye must be born again. No, you don't crawl back into mama's womb. Thank God, right? It's a metaphor. So you can't say things like, well, don't say the Bible's metaphor. Well, you can. Because in Psalm 23 and verse 5, the Bible says God prepares a table in the wilderness. Do you, you think that's literal? You sitting out in the wilderness, boom, 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 eating up. Whoa, look at me. Y'all going to watch me eat. Arrows flying everywhere. It's not literal. It's figurative. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that God's going to provide for you and protect you no matter what situation you face. And by the way, no matter what your cosmology is, that's true. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, the clouds are the dust of his feet. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Sometimes I play with that when I'll be sitting in an airplane. I'll look at somebody and say, hey, we just missed him. And they'll be like, what? i say, look at there. The Bible says, Nahum 1-3, the clouds are the dust of his feet. Okay, look. It doesn't literally mean that God's walking around right now in the sky, in these clouds and those clouds and those clouds. It's a metaphor referring to the sovereignty of God that everywhere you look, there's God's fingerprints and footprints. It's a metaphor. I love this one. Acts 17, verse 6. Now, by the way, both parties are going to like this one. Pay attention. Buckle in. <laughs> Acts 17, 6. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that when these people were arrested, the religious 
crazy political dignitaries looked at these disciples and said, These men have turned the world upside down. Now, if that's literal, y'all's model is screwed. <laughs> that's not literal, it's figurative. It's not even a globe situation. He's not talking about turning the world upside down. He's talking about the power of the gospel through them made so much change around the world that it looked like they were wrecking everything. Does that make sense? Now, I know when you go to Brother Dean's church, y'all get preaching, right? You, you, you get the word of the Lord. But I can tell, and, and our people, they get the word of the Lord. I can tell some of y'all done showed up and y'all don't have a pastor that preaches the Bible because you can't figure out right now what you're supposed to believe because what you want to believe is what YouTube told you. What you fail to believe is what God clearly tells you in the Bible. And that's dangerous. And that's where you are going to have to draw the line. Right? And so there's metaphors about turn the world upside down. That's a metaphor. Oh, you'll love this metaphor. Isaiah 66 in verse number 1. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. Okay. First of all, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You start talking about God having feet. That's not even Christian theology anymore. Okay? And so understand. Listen to me. It says simply... That the footstool was beneath the sovereign rule and the authority of God. And people are like, and I don't say everybody in this room, but there are people all over the internet that say, well, you know, it's a footstool. A footstool has pillars. A footstool is flat. Well, that's cute until you get to Hebrews chapter 1, where God the Father said to God the Son, because Jesus is God. Hmm? Deny that theology, and I don't care what your cosmology is. Okay? God the Father said to God the Son, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. You see, both of them are figurative. Because you can't use footstool, Isaiah 66 and verse 1, to proclaim flat earth unless you're going to believe that enemies are flat as well. It is figurative language, ladies and gentlemen. There's no, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's an analogy that God is very clearly speaking. What about this, Matthew chapter 5? You are the light of the world. Are you the light of the world? Yes, figuratively, here's why. Jesus is the light of the world. We're the reflectors of the glory and the light of God, Matthew chapter 5. But you don't walk around with batteries in your back. It's a metaphor for the glowing of your testimony because of the gospel. Which, by the way, only half the crowd will like this and less than half the crowd will understand this. That's also a beautiful picture. You see, Jesus is the light. We're not the light. We reflect and radiate that light just like the moon reflects and radiates the light of the sun because the light does not come from the moon itself. You do understand that, right? Half of you understand that. It's metaphorical terminology. Metaphorical terminology. Metaphorical terminology. I got the mic, you don't. Now, here's one. Remember when I said, when I did my little, what they call a diatribe, I got one verse. Everybody said, yep, he's going to go to Isaiah. Circle of the earth. I could care less. Circle, ball. Because here, here's, the, here's the argument. Well, a circle's not a ball. That's true. But a ball is a circle. And guess what? Ball in early Isaiah, he's exactly right. Ball and circle, two different words. But you know what the word ball means in the Hebrew? Circle. But I don't care about the circle of the earth. The comp Okay, listen, that's not even what I'm going to tell you. You know there's one verse in the Bible that disproves flat earth immediately, without hesitation. We ought to drop the mic and go home. Y'all ready for it? You want to wait for it? Okay. Listen to what the Bible says. It's two verses, one concept. Psalm 103. Some of you know where I'm going. You, you was hoping I didn't know this one was in the Bible. Verse 11 and 12. We're going to take it one verse at a time. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now, do you believe that? Yes or no? I do. As the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy. But if you believe there's a limit to the heaven, you've limited God's mercy. And Romans says that you nor any height or depth can take you away from the love of God. So if you're going to tell me there's a structure that's blocking the rest of the heaven, you have just minimized the mercy of God. For as the heaven, in the same way, in the same like manner, as the heaven is high above the earth, not just 
a few thousand you know, miles and the throne of God sits on top of a... No, 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 I'm going to explain all that to you from the Bible also. Uh, by the way, I, I have my right to a theological opinion. You understand that? I sat there quietly, clapped, and amen. Okay? The whole time. And enjoyed it and learned some stuff. Because every man can be my teacher. If you can't learn, if you know everything, you need deliverance. So, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. So, in, let me just say it this way. My model, the mercy of God's endless. In your model, there's a cap on it. Now, don't shrug your shoulders and be like, that ain't what the Bible says. It's clearly what the Bible says. I don't care what version you use, that's what it says. But that's just the first part. Because you can believe, by the way, in a dome, but not a flat earth. That's okay. I don't you believing in a dome does not offend me. You see, you believe in half a globe. You halfway there. We just believe God completed the whole thing. You believe in a snow globe. We believe in a full globe. Okay? But nonetheless, some of you are like, man, I've been believing flat earth all this time. I never heard my say it like that. Well, that's all right. It's the facts. Because here is right here the stop to the whole argument. As far. Shout far. As far as the east is from the west. Now, wait a minute. Why is that even a theological concept? Because when you're going east, you're always going east. When you're going west, you're always going west. But when you go north, you eventually go south. And when you go south, you eventually go north. Now, I understand their explanation that north's in the middle and it goes south, 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 south. I just saw it on his model. So not only have you limited the mercy of God, you have limited the redemptive power of God because in a flat earth model, east and west is not the same as in what the Bible teaches, a spherical earth model where east and west never meet, never intersect, never show up, and never say howdy and shake hands. As far as the east is from the west, so God had taken my sin and removed them far from me. They will never, ever, 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 ever meet again unless you're a flat earther. Is that... No? No? Why is that not the facts? Oh, see, I love that. I love when they say that going in circles is circumnavigation. No, no, no. Going in circles is what people in a loony bin do. There is no proper east and west unless you make it up on a flat earth model. Because if you believe in infinite plane in all directions, some of you do, some of you don't, don't care, then guess what? North and south keep going, 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 going. East and west keep going, 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 going. And if you're going to say that, well, you know, east and west just work on the inside round and round and round and round, you know as well as I do that had no intention in the text whatsoever. If that's the only verse we had, it's the only one we need. I see them little balls floating around. Look, there's no other way to dissect and exegete properly that verse other than what we know to be true because it's what the Bible said, not what NASA said. See, people get mad all they want to. But I'll preach to a full tent tomorrow whether you show back up or not. You understand that? I ain't here for money. I'm so sick of these people. Well, you ain't nothing but a shield. I've heard people call Dean a shield. Well, he's just paid opposition. What? At least he believes it. At least he's passionate enough to proclaim it and get up here and fight it out and duke it out in front of thousands of people all over the world with me. Y'all just a bunch of shields. Now, let me tell you something. There ain't nobody in this room. Nobody in this room. I promise you this. There ain't nobody in this room fought the Masonic Lodge more than I have. That devilish, wicked, low-down, sorry, good-for-nothing, sex-trafficking, satanic cult of an organization, it's wicked as hell. But somehow or another, because I believe in a spherical earth, 
I'm siding with the Masons. You know the authority that tells us who the Masons were in the historical records are people on YouTube that have no authority to tell me that? Not everybody's in the Masonic Lodge, folks. Some of you know I done called out some false prophets in this church. I could have made millions with them cats. I ain't for sale. No matter what shape the earth is. So stop all this. Well, you just, uh, y'all just working for the free, we ain't working for the Freemasons. Freemasons can eat my dirty socks, bunch of devils, bunch of demons. We call it out every Sunday night. There's a spirit that goes along with the Masonic Lodge. And to say that a Christian that loves God, been preaching 31 years, well, he must be just yoked up with NASA and the Masonic Lodge because he believes in a spherical earth. That's nonsense. Stop all that. That's apples and oranges. I mean, that, that's, that's ridiculous. And, and I want to tell you one of the reasons I called it out. Because we got people in our own church inviscerating each other over this ridiculousness. We got marriages on the rocks because of flat earth. And I'm not saying that people ain't stupid that believe the other way. I mean, there's crazy people on both sides. I get it. Both sides. We all crazy. But I've never, ever, ever, and I have messed with a lot of doctrine. I've never dealt with anything that is more divisive in the local church than flat earth theology. Never. Never. I mean, we got people that, that came to this church two or three years. Good people here tonight. The moment I called it out, I was lost. I'm not even saved. I'm not even regenerate. You working for the Mason? What? You believed everything until that one little deal? It's that big a deal to you? You know why it's that big a deal? I'm going to tell you why it's that big a deal. Because it has become a graven image to you. It's all you think about. I didn't even start studying it until I said I'm going to do the debate. And I'm sick of thinking about it already. Now look, if you can handle it in moderation, handle it in moderation. But it has become an idol to some people. It's all they talk about. And they're like, well, you know, Jesus came to bring a sword and bring division. Not about the shape of the earth. So anyhow, uh, y'all can weasel your way out of Psalm 103, verse 11, 12, all you want to. But then I'm, I'm going to do something real quick. How many of y'all, I got it all marked up. How many of y'all seen this right here? FlatEarthDoctrine.com? Let me, let me ask it again. How many of you have seen the verses, the 240 plus verses, flatearth.com? You've, you've seen this at least floating around as a meme on the internet. Dear God, I hope you've actually read some of these verses before you showed up to this debate tonight. All right. Anybody ever seen this? It's, it's usually black. Okay, a, a handful of you. Well, that's telling right there. I want to get this cat's name right. He might be here tonight. I don't know. Nathan Roberts. Author of The Doctrine of the Shape of the Earth, A Comprehensive Biblical Perspective. If what I'm about to read to you is comprehensive, somebody needs to change that man's diaper. He's a baby in the Lord. A, yeah, I did say a baby in the Lord. Comprehensive doc. Have you seen some of the stuff on this list? Oh, no, no, no. No, because you just share it on Facebook without reading the 240 some odd verses that are supposedly on here. Here we go. Let's just deal with a few of them. Let me get some low-hanging fruit here real quick. By the way, 240 plus flat earth doctrines. And let me say this. If you've not read every single one of the verses that are on this list, I know more about your stuff than you do. That's all there is to that. Because I'm sick of y'all saying, there's 240 verses. What? Then how come you don't read them? You just assume they're there? Do you know one of the verses on this list is Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God? Well, you know, the earth is still, so you know, Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. Some of you didn't even know that was on the list. He could have put Worship Bozo the Clown on the list and put a fake reference. And some of you would have been like, 241 verses now, preacher. He hadn't even read it. Then he likes to say things like this. Well, you know, Matthew's Bible from 1537 says flat earth. Okay, first of all, I don't read Matthew's Bible from 1537 because the S's were F's and the V's were this. Oh, you, you, you couldn't read it if you had it in your lap. Yeah, it says flat earth. It sure does. 
2 Samuel 11, 11, I believe it is. You know what it says? Talking about a, a military installment, an army, in a certain area, fighting another army. And it says, and they went up and pitched their tents upon the flat earth. Which literally means open field. And everybody's like, oh, give me that $30,000. Flat earth's in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, sure is. You think one army in one city against one other military institution installment is spreading their tents out over the whole flat earth? Mm -mm. No, you're reading a comic book if you believe that. It's just a simple phrase that was mentioned in 1537. And every other time it's been translated. And I don't even mind the translation. Some people like to play translation games. I'm going to read 20 translations until it says what I want it to. Right? Now, this ain't a bad marriage. This is the Bible. Some of y'all argue until you get that person and that text to say what you want it to say. That's not exegesis. That's eisegesis. That's reading into the Bible what you wish was there because what is clearly there doesn't need to be brought out because it'll make you uncomfortable and you'll have to change your foolishness. About anything. About anything. And so he puts that in there. It's not even a reference. He even puts a reference in Revelation 21, 15 through 17 and says this, New Jerusalem, the huge cube. We ain't talking about cubes. And we ain't talking about New Jerusalem. We're talking about earth. Do you know that was on there? Has nothing to do with flat earth. As most of these verses do not, by the way. But let me give you a couple of good ones that I think is uh, quite interesting. In 2 Kings, and they can put it up there, but I'm not going to read through all these. I've got to give you a bunch of just the highlights, cliff notes. You, you can read this. It's, it's on every one of your Facebook pages at some point in the comment section, every one of you. I get it like 15 times a day, so don't tell me it's not there. Okay, It's, it's everywhere. It says, uh, he, and I love how he gives his own descriptions of what the passage is supposed to say. But it, it is this. 2 Kings 20, 8 through 11. You remember Hezekiah? The Bible talks about the sundial going backwards. He says, uh, the sun moves backwards. Two things about that. Number one, that has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. Secondarily, here's what's interesting. Did you know a sundial only works because of a curved earth? What? Oh my goodness. He's breaking out science. He's one of them scientism believers. Sundial cannot work on a flat earth. Y'all can stay till 2 o'clock in the morning, argue all night. We'll turn the live stream off. I'll sleep good. I promise you can argue and fuss, cuss. You can get mad as you want to. But sundials have nothing to do with the shape of the earth, but everything to do with the fact that, guess what? The sundial don't even work forward or backward without proper shadowing of a curved earth. But nonetheless, we'll keep going. Even if you don't like that description, it still has nothing to do with the flat earth model. Oh, I love this one. Everyone sees Jesus. Revelation 1-7, right? Well, you know, in Revelation 1-7, the Bible says when Jesus comes again, the whole earth, every eye shall see him. Okay, even if the world was flat, you wouldn't be doing that. Show me somebody parachuting 15 miles from here, right now. Okay, it doesn't work that way. You say, well, he's God. He sure is, and so he explains himself well. Revelation 1 7 is a prophetic fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24 when he comes back and the Jews see him They look upon him whom they have pierced and a nation shall be born in a day But just in case that wasn't good enough for you and it don't do you fancy I got one better for you Because everybody's like well, you know Everybody's gonna see Jesus and so the only way everybody at one time can see Jesus is if the earth is flat Well that dog only hunts until you get to Revelation chapter 11 Revelation chapter 11 talks about the two witnesses. And when the Antichrist kills them, the Bible says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street in the gate of the city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people of the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies for three days and a half and shall not suffer the dead bodies to be put in a grave. Question, how are nations and kingdoms and tongues, how are people around the world going to see two dead people in the middle of the street in Jerusalem? Because it's not about cosmology, it's about technology. And everybody says, well, you know, everybody's going to see Jesus when he comes back. You know why? Because if indeed that verse is literally referring to everybody seeing him, everybody's got a device in their hand and everybody's going to see him. It has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. Nothing to do with the shape of the earth. But that verse is there. Then I, I love these high altitude perspectives, right? That's what he calls them. He puts three of them in here. 
Daniel 4.11 and Daniel 4.20, which are both, by the way, the same story, the same passage. Look, we, we could stay here and go verse by verse, line by line all night long. But it's right there. You can look at the list. Daniel 4.11, Daniel 4.20. It talks about a tree, right? The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. And then in verse 20, it talks about this tree that's so tall. And so he puts it here as a flat earth doctrine that only on a flat earth model can you see a tree that grows up that high. But what they do not tell you is right in the context of the verse, it says, And the tree that thou sawest, O Nebuchadnezzar, is thee, O king. And the nations shall bow down before you. And what's interesting is that in this context, he wasn't just talking about Nebuchadnezzar being the tree. It's plain in the King James. He plainly said two times in the story that it was a dream. You know, I've flown in my dreams, but I ain't ever flown in real life. A dream's a dream. And you're going to base a theological position off an evil king's dream that already had the interpretation from Daniel himself. You are the tree. So we could deal with that one. Now, everybody loves Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says that the devil, everybody still with me? It says that the devil took Jesus up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. I'll, I'll give you all this authority. I'll give you all this power. Matthew 4, 8. Look it up. Then they say the only way that can happen is on a flat earth model. That he's taken to a high elevation and he is able to see all the kingdoms of the world. A couple of things. Number one, please show me where that mountain is. Okay. We're talking about Jesus, not Santa Claus. Chill down, Skippy. Okay? But I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's Midwest Pole. Here's what the Bible tells us in Luke, and here's what the flat earthers hate. In Luke 4, when it says that he was taken up by Satan to an exceeding high mountain and showed all the kingdoms of the world, it adds this little phrase and says, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. We're talking about God and Satan. This was an obvious, in context, vision that took place on top of a mountain. In a moment. I mean, look, you can go to Mount Everest and you can't even see the next ocean. And it's 29,032 feet high. You can't even see the next ocean. Okay? No, you're exactly right. And guess what? I'm about to help you with that. Because you're not either. Because the whole purpose was for Jesus. Why did the devil take him up to an exceeding high mountain? Because the devil had to teach Jesus a thing or two about cosmology. No, because in the Old Testament... When Israel failed in demon worship, it was always in the high places. It was always in the high mountain. And Jesus was the success and fulfillment of the failure of the nation of Israel. And the devil took him up to a high place and said, If you will fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. And Jesus basically said, I don't need them because I'm going to take them from you one day anyhow, whether you give them to me or not. This ain't a high altitude perspective. This is a fulfillment of Jesus. And since I ain't Jesus, I don't get to impose cosmology on it. So it works both ways. From the peanut gallery. Anybody all right? All right, now listen. Very first one. Earth created before the sun. Okay. What's that got to do with flat earth? Nothing. You understand that? Universe is complete, not ever expanding. I believe that. Our understanding of it is expanding, but the universe is not expanding. God made it all. Bam! Just like that in a moment's notice and spoke the word and it happened. 
And it happened. So that has nothing to do with flat earth. Nothing, absolutely nothing to do with flat earth. And then he says this. Skies have a face. And then he puts this in parentheses. A geometrical, geometrical flat surface. So he, he imposes on us what the definition is before we even read the verses. And, and in this verse, by the way, when he talks about, you know, the sky having a face, he's using Matthew and Luke, same passage, two different eyewitnesses. And these guys are speaking. They're not talking about the shape of the heaven or the earth. They're talking about weather conditions, plainly. But here's what's interesting. They love to use that word face. My brother did it. Did it a moment ago. The face of the waters. And so what he does here is he says, that's a geometrical flat surface. The face of the sky, that's a geometrical flat surface. Really? A couple things about that. Number one, you ever seen the face of a mountain? That's not a geometrical flat surface. You ever seen your own face? Like look in the mirror. Not only does it have topography, it's the front of a sphere. It's connected to a globe on your shoulders. And he has dozens and dozens and dozens of verses, 28 in fact, that says a geometrical flat surface is the fact when the Bible says earth has a face. And there are 28 verses that simply say the face of the earth. The face of the earth. But he tells us what to believe before we get a chance for the context to tell us why we should believe it. It's a geometrical flat surface. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's an expression. When the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, that doesn't mean that he went from one side to the other across all the flatness of the earth. It's, an exp it's a metaphor. I just gave you... Ten metaphors, and there's 10,000 of them in the Bible. It is a book of poetry, even if people want to say, you, you, you shouldn't say things like, it's a book of metaphors and a book of poetry. Why not? It's a book of poetry. Most of what is quoted comes so often out of the book of Psalms. It's a poetry book. It's beautiful. I love it. believe every word of it. But it's still analogistic. And he has... 28 verses for that one. He has, let me count them up here, 54 verses for the other faces of combined of water and sky. All of these verses, and they all say the exact same, with no, you don't even need my context or your context. The, the context is, it's a simple illustrative term. It's just the face of the earth. Just, that, that's it. it there's, there's, no, there's no shape in it. It, it. Nobody wins that argument. Not me, not you. It, it, it's not a face as far as the shape of the earth. It's an expression of what's happening in that particular part of the earth. Man, there's just, there's so many. I love this one. Job 37.10. Can we put that up there? Job 37.10. He says, his description is, Waters are straight, not curved. Based off this verse. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. He's talking about frozen water. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. Yeah. I have been uh, snowmobiling on frozen waters. That's, that's not a difficult reality. Now... I, I do find it interesting. Is anybody back here in the little, little backstage place back here? I'm going I'm I'm to grab a little something here. I find it interesting. I can just keep talking and walking. That one of the things that's, that's always said is water finds its own level. Water don't curve. It's interesting that when you get an actual tool called a level, that the water in the middle of it is a bubble. And, wait a minute, you ever seen a raindrop? It's spherical. Huh? Water don't curve. 
Really? You ever seen dew in the morning on the grass? Water don't curve. Uh, tell a surfer that. Water don't curve. Tell the people in the Philippines right now they're probably experiencing a unbelievable weather pattern of the ocean coming against them in a tsunami because of a huge, I think, 7.2 perhaps uh, 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 earthquake happened just maybe, what, three hours before we started, four hours before we started? Tell them that water don't curve. You see, I love how everybody's like, water finds its own level. You know why? This is beautiful. Do you know water, why water always finds its own level? Because of gravity. Because of gravity. You know why a level works? Only because of gravity. That's it. Now, I'm not interested in other people's ideas of what they think gravity is or would be here till 1 o'clock in the morning. But just to show you, all right, just to show you, let's just be honest. Listen, we're, we're trying to be honest tonight, right? Is that what we want? Bootleg honesty? Let's just be honest. How many of you in this room, on either side, in our church, it don't matter. No shame in this game. We just talking. We just debate. How many of you do not believe in gravity? Would you stand to your feet right now? Stand here, just stand up for a minute. And that's okay. I'm not shaming you. I'm not shaming you. I'm not shaming you. All right, now sit down. That's fine, man. So all of that, we, we can get into all the science, but I, I find it interesting that we want to use Bible verses to try to backhandedly teach something that simple observation doesn't even teach. Okay? You can come up with all these, and I know even, even Mr. Uh, Flat Earth Dave, I know he has a whole different, you know, he doesn't have the, you know, upward acceleration. He's got, he's got this whole, you know, fantastical idea. I get it. I, I applaud people that want to use their brain. I'm not trying to shame people. My whole deal is believe in Flat Earth all you want and let's be friends, but do not tell me that the Bible consistently teaches it. It doesn't. The Bible does not teach any form of cosmology as far as the shape of the earth is concerned. I'm not talking about creation for all of the soundbite technicians that are in the room. But then it says earth has ends. There are 40 verses that talk about the ends of the earth. Now, do, do I believe in that phrase? Absolutely, of course I believe in that phrase. I wouldn't be a Bible believer if I did not. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. And again, he's got all of these verses. There's no way that I can deal with all of them. But in verse 49, listen what the Bible actually says about this context. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth. It's pretty plain. He's going to bring them from the end of the earth. As swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. He tells Israel, a nation from the far reaches of the world are going to come and they are going to subdue you. But let's just say, let's just say, hypothetically from my side, that this really means that these people are coming from, to gather them up, coming from the end of the earth, then I have to be clear. Are you then saying that you believe there are multitudes of people that live on the ice wall at the end of the earth that are going to come in and subdue the nation of Israel? If you believe that, that's okay. That's okay. But it's the problem of taking metaphorical terminology and trying to make it literal because he clearly is not talking about any actual ends of the earth. He's talking about far regions and distances. Let me give you another one. He, he gives many. You can, you can read them anytime. They're, they're all right here. And they're all in the Bible, right? They're all in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. Okay, so is God, literally, literally speaking, is God going to pronounce judgment 
upon those geographical real estate ends, or is it maybe referring metaphorically to the people in the far regions of the world that God's going to judge because they did not live right? Well, if a gun was put to my head, I believe I'd go with the metaphorical analogy. Okay? And there are many, 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 many of these. Isaiah 52. Matter of fact, let me just give you another one. Isaiah chapter 52. I, I love using the Bible, so I, just, I, I, like to, I like to flip. I don't care about them screens. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. The Lord, the, by the way, these are on his list, not mine. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So now the ice wall has eyes. And they're going to see the salvation. No, it's the people from far distant regions. It's, it's simple metaphor. And it's truly unbiblically silly to try to force anything else into the text. And there are many, many, many of these. Matter of fact, here's one that he did not put on his list. And I don't think it was uh, accidental oversight, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Psalm 22, verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before him. I wonder why he skipped that one. Well, because it proves that the ends of the world are people, not actual ends, that are guarded by a continent that is not stretched around the entire circumference of a flat earth model. It's just not. And I can't wait till we go. We're going. We're going. Okay. We're, um, money's in the bank. We're going. We're going. And let me tell you something. I'll eat crow. I've apologized for a lot of things in my ministry. But I hope y'all be willing to repent as well. Because we're going. Let me tell you something else we're going to do. Maybe. I'm working on this. You see, I came well prepared. I may not have all the understanding scientifically of the inner workings. And I appreciate all of his study. But I do some pretty good due diligence. There's an outfit called Worldview that launches next year. They got these big capsules that they put six people in. You know what I'm talking about? And they, no, 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 no. Don't CGI me because I'm going to put you in one of them. And they, they put six people in these capsules. They put them in a balloon. They take them up to 110,000 feet. Now look, look, I don't care about your fisheye lens. I don't, care about your, I don't care about your horizon. I fly around the world all the time. You ain't gonna see no you know, curvature at 35,000 feet. You're just not. So you win that one. But I love how you say, that picture of curvature out that airplane window is, is curved. Yeah, but when it's straight, the picture's okay, I guess, right? So you can't have it both ways. It's hypocritical. So, I contacted the people that have already done their tests and gone up there, right? It cost $75,000. You computing with me? $75,000 to put one person amongst six in a capsule. I got a rancher friend in Texas. I called Worldview, I think is what it's called. And I've got things worked out, hopefully, not date wise. Got it down to 50 grand. 50 grand. And got a cattle rancher in Texas, gonna pay for the ticket. And I'm gonna let either Dave, Dean, Mark Sargent ain't going. Mark Sargent ain't one of y'all, by the way. You know that. He's done more damage to the flat earth movement than any Hollywood actor on the planet. And I don't care if you're in the room tonight, Mark Sargent. You ain't going to get to Mike know how. I love that show, you know, Beyond the Curve. 
And they're trying to make flat earthers not look like they're people that are crazy that live in their mother's basement. And then the next scene is Mark coming out of his mother's basement and she's cooking him food. He's not done you any favors. But you can choose whoever you want to. Whoever you want to. We'll get the cattle rancher. And since I've not seen it and you've not seen it, I'm going to take your word for it. You ain't got to take no fisheye limbs. You can just go right on up in that capsule, sip you some coffee. It's an eight-hour tour. Got them down to 50 grand. What a deal. So when you get froggy, let's jump. You see, I believe in putting money where the mouth is. I don't believe in just open-ended saying, well, you ain't never saw it. And you know that most people never will until now. So we're going to send someone up, and me and him are going to get sent out there. And we're going to go find your magnetic Mount Maru nonsense with the spear of destiny. You know started that, a Satanist? Don't you come about this argument of authority NASA, NASA, the first person to put flat earth on the internet was Mark Braun, and that guy is a satanic, blood, ritualistic heathen. And I don't care if you're in the building either, I'll cast a demon out of you tonight quick. And then I go, NASA's evil. You got your ideas of a lot of this nonsense from Mark Braun, who is beyond evil and even claims to be Satan himself. Don't come to me with that argument of authority. You have no authority. Nobody believed this stuff before YouTube other than a handful of people that got a little bit resurrected in 1971. But before that, it was just a Catholic church, which I find interesting. Catholic means universal. It was a Catholic church that held on to Samuel Rehoboam's stuff for all these years. No, nobody went for it. It's been outdated and disproven for 2,500 years. 2,500 years. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, you know, oh, tells me you're part of the last day's deception. That's what you're part of. Now, by the way, if you can get up here and say that about me, why can't I get up here in this church and say that about you? It's a deception. It's caused more division than anything I could ever imagine. I have been treated better by the alphabet cult than I have flat earthers. In a month. In a month. You know, I, I got Muslims that I call out that treat me better than flat earthers. It has become the most vitriolic, divisive amount of bogusry on both sides. I'm not saying that we're not always, you know, the right ones. Listen, we, we're causing trouble too. We're throwing gas on the fire too. But I, I hope that at least we can understand that when we leave tonight, yeah, we get passionate. Yeah, we get fired up. Yeah, we talk back to the crowd. Yeah, we throw maters and taters. Okay, we get that stuff all the time. We, we've been in the trenches for a long time. But if we're going to talk about being spiritually persecuted, make sure it's for the gospel. Not because of what you think the shape of the earth is. Oh, my goodness. I just can't get my family to invite me back to Thanksgiving dinner. I just love Jesus so much. Maybe it's not because you love Jesus so much. Maybe it's because you won't shut up about the shape of the earth. It's really not that big a deal. It's really not. Because we believe the same thing about creation. And you've tried to make creation flat earth. We don't disagree about creation. We disagree about the shape of that which was created. Now look, there's 240 of them on here. I'm not going through all of them, obviously. But it's shocking to me that I can ask, and I don't even know, maybe a bunch of people raise their hand up, but I can ask, who's read this? Who's seen this? And everybody's like, uh, look at this whole full room. And, and, and these are the definitive doctrinal verses for flat earth. Do you have any more? Oh, I got Dean's list too. Got all the verses. We've already dealt with some of the verses that Dean gave me. Every single one of them. Do you need to say something? Well, hold, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You got the mic. Just go ahead. Let okay. me finish my verse, but you go ahead. I just want to say this about, about that list and about Nathan Roberts. Okay? Let, let's, and I'm not saying you're affiliated with him. No, 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 no. We, 
No. All right. Shh, shh, shh. Let me. Just a second. Just a second. I just want to say this about Nathan Roberts. Okay, what you're doing with that list there, you're debating Nathan Roberts, not us. No, no, no. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I'm telling you the Bible. And here's how I know that. Because let me, when I discredit... Let me, let, me, let me finish what I say about Nathan, okay? But I'm not worried about Nathan. No, but, but you've been debating his list. I have no, no. Never, I have, let, me, let me say what i got to say about his list. I have never posted his list because I don't agree that all of the verses refer to... I don't b okay. believe that you agree with all of them. Okay. Absolutely. There's some of them that are okay. just foolish. Now, some of them refer, he says, flat earth, but he's talking about just cosmology in general. But listen, Nathan Roberts was a young believer who I had to correct and rebuke and instruct on many things. He was a very young believer, and he was wrong about a lot of things, and he has since disappeared. Now, if you want to debate him... You can I know he's him. since disappeared, but here's the deal. These verses have so infiltrated the movement, whether you wrote them or not. That's why when I contextually disprove them, the crowd shouts at me, and they're mad. Here, well, here, here, well, hear what I'm saying, though. I hear what you're saying. Hear what I'm saying is Nathan Roberts is not the issue. And we don't agree with a lot of scriptures that's on his list that he took them out of context and they don't apply. So using his list is not debating me. It's debating him. Absolutely. But the question is... How many verses do you have for flat earth? How many? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He only dealt with the firmament. He only dealt with the firmament. There were no verses that he used no. on flat. Not one. Y yes, I did. Not yes, I only did. the clay. And I explained that. That's sunrise. No, 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 no. You didn't deal with the other verses. I pulled from Isaiah and Psalms. You didn't deal with that. Well, but I will. I was going to say in my rebuttal. Do I still get a rebuttal? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I mean, we are not going to be able to go all night. But yeah, go ahead and start doing a rebuttal right now. It'll be all right. I got so much to say. These verses, there's, there's tons of these verses. I got, I got pages of my own notes. Pages. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be brief here. And I do, you said, and I'm going to hold you to your word. You said that I could bring anybody I wanted. So I'm going to call up a couple of people to answer some things. Austin and... Uh, We'll let you come up and answer a couple of things that you've said. But let me, let me address just a few things in what Pastor Greg just showed. I'm going to show you some things. Now, first of all, I want to say this. And let me go back to my notes here that I made while you were speaking. First of all, you say you're okay with us believing flat earth. Then you say that it's end time deception. Then you talk about you don't, you don't want to insult people, but then you say things like, you make God a liar if you believe flat earth. So I don't see how that, you called us clowns. I didn't say that tonight. Smoke. No, but you said it through this whole thing. So what I'm saying is, is that we, the, the people out here that are getting a little upset with you is because it, you're the way that you insult people. That oh, no, 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 wait, uh-uh. You said we weren't Christians if we didn't believe in no, flat earth. No, 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 yes, no, you no. most certainly no. did say oh, that. Oh, no, Absolutely. No, no. Don't you You're shout me down do in my own church. Listen to me. I never said, and then this is a fact. You, Absolutely I, you I did. I've preached this for years. Don't interrupt me. I have said for years, you do not have to believe in flat earth biblical cosmology to be a born again Christian. I have never made that an issue. We'll I rewind have, the video tonight when we're done when you said... That we're not biblical Christians I if we do I, not hey, adhere hey, to the flat earth model. When you used to speak out against tongues and deliverance, you were not a biblical Christian in that area. And guess what? Tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Flat earth is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's in the Bible. Are what a gonna, heretical well, bunch of nonsense. Do I, do, do I get to do my rebuttal without you interrupting me or uh, not? Quit asking me questions if you don't want me to rebuttal back. Do I need to, you said you would speak, then I would get a rebuttal. Yeah. Let me have I was it. still speaking, but I've been nice enough to let you jump up and rebuttal. Let me finish. So let me, rebuttal. Let me actually give one without interrupting. Then don't ask me a question. That's the whole point. We did this a minute ago where we asked questions and you let me speak and I let you speak. I didn't say And no that's what word. we're doing. I didn't say a word. So give your rebuttal. So I'm going to give it. All right. First of all, let's say this. And by the way, I'm just going to add this in. You know, when we came this weekend... I was hoping that things would stay sweet and nice between us, but it's not the case. And so what I did was I rented a room at the, uh, at the Marriott for tomorrow morning if anybody wants to come have church with Fire and Grace Church. Absolutely. 
because I'm not going to sit here under this kind of belligerent attacks and calling people names and stuff like that. I'm just not going to. I can't, I can't come back here because of it. Okay. All right. But here, so you but, can do it, but I can't be abrasive because then that hurts I'm everybody's not, feelings. I, 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 I That's okay. I get it. Hold, I get on, it. Hold on a second. I get it. Has anybody, has anybody, I've never called you a clown. You called, when you got up talking about this a few weeks ago, you said. Hey, that, quit saying a few weeks ago. That was the first time, time I ever even mentioned it. I'm talking about tonight. Tonight you have been insulted. And, and, and I wanted to keep it nice. And listen, I, let me say this very, let me say this very clearly. Let me say this very clearly. You told me that I was involved in a deception. You are. And then when I say it, you're like, oh my no, goodness, that's fine. my feelings that's fine. are hurt. We believe each other's deceived in there. That's fine. But when you say moronic, idiotic, when you start going down... I didn't call you or anybody that. I said we attack ideologies. And as far as I'm concerned, the ideology is moronic. All right. Let me, let me, let me show you where you were. This, this is the kind of stuff. He said, okay. He started this out in Hebrews 11.3. I took a little note here. It says, through faith... We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that which uh, so the things which are seen are not made with things which appear. Now his argument was that the term worlds here means the planets, the solar system. The word here, if he looked it up in the Greek dictionary, he'd find out it doesn't mean anything like that. In fact, the word is the Greek word eon, which means ages or time periods, not planets. So that that you just did with that verse is deception and error. Well, then explain the two verses that I used that led into that verse because they did prove that we are the only habitable planet amongst many. No, no, no. Well, first of all, the word planet does not exist. It's used one time in the King James Version, and that's a mistranslation because the actual... It's always a mistranslation when it doesn't Hebrew fit word, your side. The it's actual, always a mistranslation. Me. The actual Hebrew word is mazalah, which means constellations, not planets. And that's a fact. And that's not a fact. Then you're deceived. All right? If me being deceived means I believe in a spherical earth, I'm deceived, and you can just go ahead and leave and cancel this debate right now because you're not going to convince me what the Bible clearly says. The earth is not flat 1,000%, and if I got people in our church that think it is, that's great. I love you, but if you want to go to his little service in the morning, then go to his service in the morning. It's not going to bother me one bit. The earth is not flat. It was disproven 2,500 years ago. You can't show me one verse in the Bible that proves that the earth is flat. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. We're not going to get anywhere else because here's the problem. You use two hours of PowerPoint presentation and your people are quiet. I use an hour and 15 minutes of the Bible and they get mad and start throwing maters and taters at me. Okay? All right. So. Here, here's the deal. Let me just say this. And I, I will. I'm, I'm walking out now. But I want to say this. Oh, listen. The, your, your folks are standing up yelling, go, get out. Okay. You know what? That's fine with me. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I gave you the scriptures. He gave you her, his version. It's well, always you, no, somebody hold on, else's hold on, version. Hold on, hold on. No, no. This you, is nonsense. You came up with your scriptures and gave your interpretation of them. I gave mine. I gave you the Bible interpretation. I gave you the Bible. Them. I gave more Bible than you did for a fact right there. All right. Oh, really? That's a fact. Well, I'll tell you what. How about, how about in your rebuttal, I'll keep my mouth shut and you tell me how wrong I was about your misapplication of the ring stamping no, 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 uh, yeah, in Job yeah. chapter 38. First of all, hello, is it sunrise or not? Not, not at all. I don't agree with Turn you. Turn his mic off. Get out. Wow. You're a Bible denier. You're a Bible denier. You're a Bible denier. That is ridiculous. Bible denier. Just get out. Get the band up here. Woo! Let's worship the Lord. I ain't putting up with this nonsense no more. I gave you our platform. And y'all want to get up here with a bunch of nonsense. Come up here, band. Let's worship the Lord. We're going we're gonna to actually do something spiritual in this room tonight instead of talk about flat earth nonsense. And by the way, if you go to this church and you're upset about me taking the Bible in its context and dealing with it, and you're going to keep sowing that discord, don't ever come back. That's all I'm going to tell you right now. Don't, I'm not listening. It's a last day's deception. 
I do not care if this is a UFC smackdown to the mat. I would highly suggest that people keep their mouth shut, get in their car, and go where they need to be. We'll see you at 10.30 in the morning. We're going to have a packed house, and we're going to preach what the Bible says. If you believe the Bible, Global Vision, shout amen!